lecture we are going to discuss about uh, a slightly different method that what we uh, discussed uh, in the morning session so in the morning session the two lectures by professor bandopadhyay and professor reddy you were introduced to this uh, molecular mechanics or molecular dynamics simulation which essentially uses the concept of force field into classical mechanics and then it applies uh, this method to um you can use it for small molecules you can use it for large bio uh, macromolecules you can use them for materials so the uh, possibility of application is huge in that molecular mechanics now uh, what i am going to do is i am going to introduce you to a new dimension to this molecular dynamics simulations that is the qm or the application of quantum mechanics in particular my focus will be to talk about hybrid qmmm keeping this in mind that you already have spent some time in learning about the md simulation i would try to frame my talk as a simple add on to the previous two lectures that you uh, heard in the morning now before we begin let me uh, say if you uh, let me have a few remarks here uh, if we look at the history of the, the progress of uh, quantum mechanical simulation and molecular me mechanical simulation we would see uh, that these two fields they for a long time they progressed parallelly there were uh, strengths and weaknesses of molecular dynamic simulations there were strengths and weaknesses of quantum mechanical simulations but then there were some fixed set of problems that md simulations or the people involved in md simulation research uh took up and similarly there were a set of other problems that were ideally suited for quantum mechanical uh, approaches people took up those these two fields did not interact much uh, uh during the course of time but of course in recent time things have changed because of various uh, um, uh, various factors some of them we will discuss uh in this in the, in the course of this lecture because of which now we have started using both these methods simultaneously and what we call is this hybrid method now the story of or the history or the uh, the theoretical development of quantum mechanical uh, models like it goes back to um, 1920s so we have a um, history of to cover for longer than a century uh application of quantum mechanical principle to chemical system uh through using uh, computational uh, using computers is let's say uh, about 60 years old so that itself also is a very long history so i would not be able to cover that part if i try to do that that would be a futile exercise so instead what i have decided is that i would leave this part that what what all features you can uh, how the quantum mechanical uh, calculations evolved over the time i would leave that part rather what i would focus is that i'll build up on this quantum mechanical approach into the molecular dynamic simulation that you already have seen in the morning sessions all right with this uh, clarification let us go ahead and uh, see what we can learn about this before we fix anything else let us see why and where do we need our qm calculations because in the uh, previous talks you must have been um, uh, convinced by uh, my colleagues that molecular dynamic simulation with the help of these uh, force fields uh, they do a, a great job in uh, many many problems and that is true to a great extent you would have realized that the power of molecular dynamic simulation is lies in this general purpose force field the force field that that was created that has been tested extensively is is applicable to a wide range of problems so that is a strength of this problem the uh, of, of this method but while they, that is necessarily a strength of this uh, approach but then there are certain weaknesses come because of very nature that we have tried to use a general purpose force field for example you have a fixed number of atom types but we know that in in real world there are always uh, chances to get surprised with a new atom in a very different chemical environment for which your force field may not have uh, an atom type uh, in a force field uh, uh, type calculations you have a fixed bonding description if you define a bond 
through a harmonic uh, potential, that bond remains uh, as is a bond because you are using this harmonic potential, which is which is not elastic. So the bonding description becomes uh, fixed. And because of this, you would, uh, since you saw in the force field that you have harmonic po potential for the bonds, harmonic potential for the angles, for the torsions. So therefore, the sampling that you would do would be limited to the equilibrium geometries. That's because of the very nature of the force field that we have designed. More importantly, the force field that uh, we use completely ignores the electronic interactions. Uh, it in fact considers a molecule as set of atoms. Of course, the presence of electrons is acknowledged through the, let's say, the, the, um, the partial charges on the atoms, which kind of describe the electronic environment in which that particular atom survives. Uh, but beyond that, we do not consider the electronic interactions. Now, keeping these shortcomings in mind, we would propose that, well, this, this, these are the reasons why we need to go beyond these molecular, classical molecular dynamic simulations. But the next question is that, all right, these sound, they, maybe these are uh, limitations, but where actually do we need to go beyond this? The answer is that we need explicit treatment of electronic interactions whenever we have defining any chemical reaction. Any two reactants, when they come and uh, make a product, we know that, well, there, there is a uh, formation of a bond or a breaking of a bond or transfer of an electron, uh, things like that. And these effects cannot be described by standard classical molecular dynamic simulations. In particular, where, where the, the, uh, the classical molecular dynamic simulation uh, has a great role that is in biomolecular systems. Among those systems, for example, if I consider enzyme catalysis, here enzymes of the proteins, they initiate uh, bond formation and bond breaking on, the, on their substrate. So these type of processes cannot be studied by classical molecular dynamic simulation. In general, whenever there are metal ions, although we have force fields for metal ions, but metal ions are uh, known to have their, uh, let's say, the quantum mechanical effect, the relativistic effects are, are, are often present. So in those cases where we have metal ions, for example, the metal enzymes and their catalysis, they are also in general, the four classical force field based methods uh, find uh, hard difficulty to describe them. Apart from this, Wherever we look for excited state processes, because the molecular dynamics of force fields have been generated, uh, keeping the, the ground state in mind. So whenever we have electronic state transition, such as in absorption or emission spectroscopy, or even in your, uh, let's say, NMR spectroscopy, in such cases, we cannot use molecular dynamic simulations to, uh, to answer those uh, questions. All right, we got to know why and where we need quantum mechanics. Now we'll look at how to treat a system with quantum mechanical approach. When we looked at the classical simulations, we saw that, well, we need uh, the initial position of the uh, particles. We need the initial uh, um, velocity or the momentum of the particles. And once we have these two, we can use a classical equation of motion to propagate the system. That was wonderful for the classical mechanics. But when we come to quantum mechanics, we already have a problem because those systems where, where, which need to be treated with quantum mechanics, they follow the principles of quantum mechanics. And there lies the problem because we have this uh, famous uncertainty principle. If we know the position of a particle, we cannot be certain about its momentum. So therefore this position momentum uncertainty makes our life difficult. We cannot use the similar way of uh, approaching the, uh, the way we took for classical mechanics. We cannot take this approach in the quantum mechanical uh, solution. So then what do we do? In quantum mechanics, we, uh, agree that whenever we define a system with quantum mechanics, we essentially want to look for this psi or the wave function, which defines the state of the system. Now this wave function psi, in fact, contains all the information about the system that you can ever possibly know about. Know. Whatever you want to know about the system is out there in this wave function. Now, what is the physical meaning of this wave function? Actually, there is none. Although wave function itself doesn't have a physical meaning, 
what has a physical meaning is its psi star psi or the uh, square of uh, the wave function, absolute square of the wave function, which has got a probabilistic uh, interpretation or this, this describes a probability density uh, function. So what is the probability of finding my system at a particular uh, phase space that gives, uh, that uh, is obtained by this uh, psi star psi. Now, I said that the wave function contains everything, all the information, but how do I get this information? Quantum mechanics allows us to get some information from this wave function in terms of some quantum mechanical operator. So whenever we want to ask a particular question that I want to know certain something about this particular system, that means we are interested in a particular classical observable. So quantum mechanics tells us that will get the corresponding quantum mechanical operator in this case, operator O, apply it on this wave function because wave function is the uh, place where all the information is stored. Apply this operator in this wave function and then you will get the outcome. That outcome is, is your classical observable. Now, it also says, when I do a measurement, what kind of expectation, what kind of outcome do I expect? For example, if the if I'm making a measurement with respect to an operator O, the expectation value or the average value of the outcome is given by this integral. Uh, in most of our uh, discussion now, we'll be interested in one particular operator O, instead of calling it a general operator O, the operator that we are will be most interested is the operator corresponding to the energy function or the energy observable. And that operator is my Hamiltonian operator. When I apply this Hamiltonian operator and this wave function, which contains all the information, since I'm asking a question with respect to Hamiltonian operator, the outcome is only the energy. So this equation goes by the name of Schrodinger equation and entire quantum mechanics or the, the part of quantum mechanics that we are interested in this talk will be dealing with solution of this uh, uh, Schrodinger wave equation. Now, before we do this, let us look, at, uh, think, uh, before we start thinking how to uh, solve this, let us look at this, what do, I, what do I have in this Hamiltonian operator for a molecular system? So Hamiltonian operator, the a molecule would have several nuclei. So here I'm calling capital N number of nuclei and small n number of electrons. When I have n, n number of nuclei and small n number of electrons, the Hamiltonian is, is given by this, which has, do not worry uh, about the exact form of this. So they have a uh, simple meaning. The first term is here, the kinetic energy of all the nuclei, the ma mass of the nuclei are over here. This Laplacian, uh, um, this uh, Nabla square that you see is, a Lapla is the Laplacian operator. Which, is, which forms the, uh, the, the quantum mechanical kinetic energy operator. So these terms represent the kinetic energy of my nuclei. These terms here, they represent the kinetic energy of the electron. So I have electron indices going from uh, I equals one to N. So these are the kinetic energy of electrons. I have, when I have electron and nuclei, so of, the, of course the electrons and nuclei, they are going to interact with each other. So this interaction, this is a Coulombic interaction, but this is the charge of the nucleus, nucleus A. The electron charge is kept one because I'm writing this down in atomic unit where electron uh, charge is one. And this is the distance between uh, electron I and nucleus A. And you have this sum over all A, sum over, sum over all I. So this is the potential energy between electron and nucleus. Similarly, I have interaction between two electrons, electron-electron interaction, so I uh, and J. So the, uh, the Coulombic um, uh, energy corresponding to this is one over Rij. So there is a four, four pi epsilon zero, which is again unit one in atomic unit. So that is uh, taken out. And the final term that you see is the interaction between nucleus, one nucleus with another nucleus. So nucleus A with nucleus uh, B. When I have a molecule, I have several atoms. So this nuclear, nuclear adipulsa. So these are the terms that I have in the, uh, the Hamiltonian. Now we are talking about two set of particles, one the electrons, another the nuclei. Their masses are different by the nuclei, the smallest nucleus is about uh, three orders of magnitude heavier than an electron. Uh, so therefore there are two different, uh, the particles have two very different size. So their dynamics are, are going to be very different. So what we uh, normally uh, 
invoke here is the born oppenheimer approximation which tells that the nuclear motion and the kind electronic motion can be decoupled from each other since nuclei are so heavy we can assume that while the electronic motion takes place the nuclei are essentially frozen at their place so this is called frozen nuclear approach when we invoke born oppenheimer approximation we essentially say that the electronic nuclear energy uh, sorry the kinetic energy of the nuclei they become zero because we are freezing the nuclei at their respective positions so that part becomes zero and since all my nuclei are frozen at their position so therefore this r a b the distance between the any two nuclei are, is is constant so therefore this term becomes a constant now that makes my life somewhat simpler because then in that case i do not have to worry about this and uh, the the terms that are uh, in the middle are the electronic part of the hamiltonian so instead of solving now the full hamiltonian within born oppenheimer approximation i try to solve the electronic part of the hamiltonian when i do that you remember that this electronic part of the hamiltonian actually does in, uh, depend on the Uh, nuclear positions but the, since the nuclei are fixed in that so the electronic the solution of this electronic hamiltonian that is the psi electronic the wave function corresponding to the electronic hamiltonian has a dependence of small r that is the new position of the electrons it has explicit dependence on but it has got a parametric dependence on capital r that is on the nuclear position that means this solution is valid only for a given value of r so when i change this value of r that means when i change the con nuclear conformations my wave function would change so therefore my elect electronic energy or the potential energy would also change so the potential energy that i am uh, writing down here the electronic energy this is a function of the nuclear coordinate so when i in the um, next uh, part of our discussion whenever i am saying that i am trying to solve the schrodinger equation i am always invoking von oppenheimer approximation keeping the nuclei frozen for the time being and then solve the uh, the electronic part of the problem and look at the potential energy now so you might want to think that okay since i have made several approximations already so i would be able to solve uh, this equation exactly you you be perhaps surprised to know that actually no i even cannot solve this exactly what can i solve i can solve this problem only when i can solve this problem exactly only when my n or the number of electron is one that is only hydrogen atom which has got one electron anything which is more complex than a hydrogen atom i cannot solve this schrodinger equation exactly that's that's quite a sad uh, sad part of the uh, situation but nothing to worry because the 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 growth of quantum mechanics or the progress of in quantum mechanics uh, is focused always along this direction that how i can solve this method uh, solve this equation by using several approximate methods so there are a number of approximate methods so we would not go through them but one thing that uh, we would uh, say is that here you uh, one thing you notice that if i have one electron problem i can solve this problem but when i have n number of electrons so i cannot solve that problem because of this electron electron repulsion or the two electron terms what i can solve is the one electron problem so keep this in mind one pop popular approach which is the uh, cornerstone of most of the quantum uh, mechanical uh, models for uh, chemical systems is this self consistent field method what does it say it says that okay i have this n particle problem which i am not able to solve but what i can do is that suppose i have n number of electron i cannot solve them the schrodinger equation corresponding to them but what i can solve is that if i assume one electron to be electron the rest n minus 1 number of electrons to be forming a charged cloud which is interacting with this electron electron uh, of my choice that is electron number 1 so if i put present this picture to you then you will see that my problem is no longer an n electron problem rather it is a one electron problem because this one electron is interacting with a charged cloud of which corresponds to the n minus 1 so in that way i can solve the problem for electron number 1 so this is what i say is that i make a guess for psi 2 to psi n that is for all other electrons 
and prepare a charge density corresponding to that and make that interact with the uh, electron number one and therefore solve the Schrodinger equation for n equals one, the particle, uh, first electron, only one electron. Now, this way I solve only one electron, but, but I can repeat this process. I can take this solution of psi one prime and put that in my guess list and then try to solve it for psi two. Now I get a psi two prime because again, I'm not solving an n electronic problem. I'm solving a one electronic problem. Here it happens that the electron is electron number two. So I repeat this procedure. I take third electron, fourth electron, fifth electron, and at the end of the cycle, I would actually end up getting a set of new functions compared to the initial guess that I made. Now I compare whether my guess is, my new set of functions are similar to my guess functions or not. If they are not similar, of course, I will have some ways to uh, quantify that. If they are not similar, then I start another cycle. So this new set becomes my guess. I go through this loop and come back and at the end, check whether my first initial state is equal to final set. If not, then I go back until I converge. Of course, this happens numerically, so you will have a convergence to the, uh, to the satisfaction of the, uh, the numerical accuracy that you uh, can afford. But this way, this method actually makes it the electron, instead of seeing other electrons, it observe, it interacts with the field of produced by all other electrons, and we solve this process by self-consistent field. This idea plus a few other uh, few other conditions, a uh, few other requirements that are necessary for the fermionic uh, nature of the electrons led us to what is called this Hattree-Fock methods, or also known as Hattree-Fock self-consistent field method. So this becomes the, the starting point of any quantum mechanical calculations that we do. Now, Hattree-Fock method, as we said, uh, discussed in the self-consistent field uh, description, you saw, that an electron did not interact with another electron explicitly. What it interacted is an effective field that the other electrons produce. So absolute electron-electron correlation is not present in this Hattree-Fock method. So therefore, this is not a very accurate method, although this is an affordable method. So this, this y-axis talks about the computational cost, the x-axis talks about the accuracy. So this Hattree-Fock method, although moderately accurate, but it's also moderately expensive, it's, it's, it's doable, it's affordable, but it misses out many things. Luckily, there are several post Hattree-Fock methods, for example, perturbation theory-based methods, most popular one, MP2, uh, the configuration interaction-based method, CI, the couple cluster-based cluster methods, uh, CCST, CCSTT, and all other. So these post Hattree-Fock methods, they, take us to, uh, they provide uh, accurate results, but their computational cost is also very huge. Now in this Hattree-Fock method, we use, so you evaluate several integrals. Instead of evaluating these integrals numerically, sometimes what happens, we, if we take some fixed values for those integrals, instead of uh, computing them uh, ab initio, in there we get, make some semi-empirical quantum mechanical methods. The equations are same, it's only that we do not evaluate all the integrals, we just make some integrals go away, or we just say that, okay, these kind of integrals have these fixed values from, from experiments, uh, we get them. So these are semi-empirical methods. So their computational cost is naturally less than the uh, Hattree-Fock uh, method, but its uh, accuracy is also compromised. And here are the molecular mechanics MM-based methods because they are uh, purely classical uh, force field-based uh, methods. So the computational cost is very low, but their accuracy is also low. Now, uh, just to uh, give you an example, uh, often this uh, in the quantum chemical system, uh, theoretically at least, the computational cost scales with n to the power four. Of course, in practical calculations, because of uh, various approximations, because of various tricks, we can scale it down to, let's say, a bit somewhere between n, n square to n, n to the power three, uh, but uh, the theoretical limit is n to the power four, and we'll just uh, take a hypothetical exercise for that. Suppose I have an one electron system, and I took one millisecond to solve this problem. In that, 
sense in that ha hardware that took one millisecond to solve one electron problem. If I use uh, that hardware to talk about a system with 20 electrons, mind you, this is not, not uh, much. A methane molecule, for example, would have 10 electrons. So two methane molecules. So it would take three minutes. So just enough time for you to go and check your WhatsApp and come back and your results will be, uh, your calculations will be done. Now, if I have 60 electrons, uh, which is again, just six uh, methane molecules, uh, it, you are going to take three hours. So the time that perhaps switches, which uh, you need to think how you can spend this time while the computer is doing this. If you go 100, it takes a day, 150 a week because of into the power scaling, 200 a month and 500 two years. So if you plan to do uh, your uh, PhD and in, in, in doing a calculation, so good for you, you can do perhaps two calculations, one after another, and then your, uh, your uh, PhD time is over. So this is naturally very expensive. So what do we do? We come back to this picture because there was this elephant in this room that we did not discuss about is this uh, box which is in a different color, the DFT based methods. While these Hattrifock methods and post Hattrifock methods, they always looked at the wave functional approach. That means uh, the, the, if for, for, a, for an electron, you have, you have four coordinates, three special coordinates and one spin coordinates. And as your number of electron increases in your system, so the number of uh, dimension of the problem also increases significantly. DFT based methods or the density functional theory based methods take a different approach. They say, well, not the wave function is not my fundamental uh, function, which you have all the information, rather my density is. Now from density, I can uniquely determine the energy from density, I can uniquely determine other properties. Now, what is the advantage of it? The advantage is that while wave function has four n number of coordinates, density has three coordinates because density is just x, y, z. Whether you have one electron or 10 electrons, it doesn't matter. The electron density is a function of three uh, special coordinates. So, so uh, this gave a uh, tremendous uh, boost to, our, uh, to, to the research. But of course, when you do a practical ap application, uh, DFT also takes several of the flavors of Hattrifock method. So it is not that cheap, but however, you can easily go and treat systems of let's say 200 or 500 electrons uh, in, a, in a few days or so instead of waiting a few years. Now, we have uh, this trend situation is that we looked at this molecular mechanics uh, based methods, which can be applied, uh, which can be applied to either to a small system, or let's say five atoms, ten atoms, or you can apply to a large system, 10,000, 20,000, uh, 100,000. Uh, because you have the force field, you can immediately compute the uh, ener energies and do the calculations. The thing is that in molecular mechanics, although it is not expensive, uh, its accuracy is restricted by the force field that we have used. On the other hand, when you look at the quantum mechanical methods, for very small systems, we can do very accurate calculations, for example, couple cluster or MP2 or CI, MRCI. But as we see that for the larger uh, number of atoms, quantum mechanical methods that we, we first of all cannot do and what we can do, their accuracy is also compromised. So you've gone down to this. Level. So now we have got two different methods of different strength. Molecular mechanics, you can use it for extremely large number of system atoms. Quantum mechanics, you can do very accurate method, but for that you need to have only less number of atoms. So what to do in such a case where we have two different requirements, but we want to build a single machine. So the answer is lies in many of our uh, study books. For example, here Centaur had the accuracy of man and speed of a horse. Here the mermaid has the, the wisdom of a lady and the ability to swim or survive in water like a fish. Here you have a Caesar, which also is, a, uh, which is, which also is an inch depth. And the height of, or the, the ultimate example of uh, multifunction in one or the hybrid is this the story of N Narasimha Swami, where you see that uh, uh, there is hybrid in time. So ni neither it's a day, nor it's a night, uh, neither it's outside, nor it's inside, it's on the doorstep, neither the uh, hidden ecosystem is on floor, nor is in, uh, not, neither is he on the ground, nor is he in air, he's on his uh, on, uh, lap. So all these multiple dimension hybrid uh, examples were there in this, uh, in this study. Now, coming back to chemistry, 
the solution to this problem that when we have two different requirements, but we want to find a uh, find find a single answer uh, in chemistry, the uh, the that idea is a Nobel Prize winning idea. So in 2013, Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to Martin Karplus, uh, Michael Levitt, and Adi Wurzel for the development of multi-scale uh, models for complex chemical systems. So this multi-scale is where uh, what we have one scale of classical mechanics, the other scale is of uh, quantum mechanics. What is their idea? Let us look at it. Now, in a uh, biological system, for example, let's consider an enzyme, uh, you would uh, see that these are the different alpha helices and strands of an enzyme, which are there for a particular purpose. But the main function of an enzyme is the chemical catalysis, which happens in this so-called active site. The active site, for example, for this molecule is shown over here, the reaction happens here. But, the na but nature employs the rest of this decoration to make sure that this reaction happens um, faithfully, reliably, and, and very fast. Uh, we have seen fr uh, from many examples that nature never wastes its uh, resources. Uh, if, it, if nature could catalyze this reaction with less elaborate arrangement, it perhaps would do have done this. But since it doesn't do, so we, we naturally believe that there is a role of all these residues or all the entire uh, the protein decoration, although the main function happens over here. Now, the chemical reaction occurs in a small space in the, in the, in the enzyme. Uh, this is where quantum mechanics is necessary because the bonds break and bonds form, electrons move around in this region. The rest of the region is perhaps uh, good enough for, for molecular mechanics because we have seen with molecular mechanics, we can deal with large biomolecular uh, biomolecules and obtain their properties using uh, molecular dynamic simulation. So what the idea was that well, you use all your computational resources where you need them. So that means you treat this system with quantum mechanics, let the remaining part of the system be described by molecular mechanics. So that is what the idea behind this hybrid QMM methods. Now, we'll go through some of the uh, popular uh, ways how, to, how one does this uh, QMM method. Uh, there are the QMMM calculations can be div uh, divided into two broad groups. One is uh, the subtractive method, the other in its additive method. So we'll first look at the subtractive method. So here the idea is simple. I have this protein, the large one. I, I'm trying to describe that with molecular mechanics. I have this uh, active site, which is chemically relevant. So I am going to use quantum mechanics for this. What would I do? The answer is very simple, all right? So I already know molecular mechanics, how I can do this. Uh, I can simply just introduce my force field, the, the, the um, force constant for the bonds, the angles, the proportions, the, uh, the, the Leonard-Jones terms, the Coulombic terms, all these terms, and I can calculate the energy, molecular mechanics energy of, of this system. That's not a problem. For the QM, uh, as I said that, uh, well, molecular dynamic simulation um, subject was progressing uh, beautifully. QM calculations also were making good progress. So naturally, for a small system, I can easily get my uh, quantum mechanical solution. That means I can construct the electronic Hamiltonian, get the electronic wave function and the uh, potential energy, which is a function of, uh, of the nuclear coordinates within Bonn-Oppenheimer Bonn approximation. So this calculation I can do independently. This calculation also I can do independently. So I just add them up. But then you see there is a problem. The problem is that this region that I have taken in QM is also included in this first calculation which I did with molecular mechanics. Now I have used, I have computed this system twice, this region, both as MM as well as QM. So to correct that, what I do is that I do a simple molecular mechanics on this QM si uh, size, small system, do a molecular mechanics and subtract this. If I do this, you would see that I have taken away this overcounting thing and I have replaced this small region only with QM. So my big region is taken as QMM and the chemically active region is taken by QM. So this is the basic idea of subtractive method. Now the advantage is that the subtractive method was the, uh, was the first one to that 
one who does molecular mechanical uh, mm calculations routinely uh, he would be very comfortable in doing this he just has to learn uh, how to do these qm calculations and add this and subtract them that's all if someone is familiar with doing qm calculation he has to just learn this one and then uh, subtract this and he is also done so the learning or the uh, the barrier to get started is low and it is easily implementable the mm programs just need to uh, little uh, change or the qm programs require a little change so therefore this become this is easily implementable the other advantage is that it can go beyond qmmm i'll come to that uh, in a moment's time uh, let us look at the uh, limitations uh, in fact these limitations were the limitations at the beginning of the subtractive method later on these limitations have been uh, taken care of, but uh, this is a good reminder that how we where we started from uh, one limitation is that we actually need a force field for the qm region so this qm region if i wanted to do only with qm this will not allow me because i still have to do a molecular mechanics calculation whenever i want to do molecular mechanics calculation i must have force field for it now many times what happens i do qm calculations because getting a force field for let's say if it is a protein that's all right but if it's a new ligand i do not have a, an accurate or compatible force field for them in the morning you saw that if your force field isn't compatible or if your force field is not accurate molecular dynamic simulation will not give you proper results so therefore if if i even if i want did not want to get a force field for this uh, small active site but still the subtractive method forces me to have it otherwise i cannot take care of this correction but it turns out that even if your molecular force field is poor for this region it doesn't matter because the same force field also is calculated here essentially you are subtracting this out so most of the errors that you might have introduced because of a poor force field anyway gets cancelled out so to a large extent that error is mitigated the other point is that the absence of qm polarization for example when i am doing this quantum mechanical calculation the protein is out there it has a role but when i do this qm calculation i do not my this quantum mechanical system the active site system does not feel the presence of the rest of the protein so that absence of the mm region to polarize my qm system is a limitation but this also has been corrected we'll, we are going to discuss it in a uh, in, in a uh, moment's time uh, but let us look at this advantage that how the subtractive methods can go beyond this qm mm or how it can even go to multi layer so this is the standard uh, subtractive method where we have a mm region qm region and minus uh, mm now we we'll look at this uh, multi layer so suppose i have this protein i call this size of the system as s1 uh, which is a large system so i cannot do very accurate calculation on this entire system so i see that in my protein uh, there is an intermediate region of size 2 which is chemically relevant although only the chemical reaction happens in s3 this size 3 region size 2 or s2 that has a role that has a chemically important role but not as important as s3 and certainly more important s2 has more importance than s1 so i have now three different layers how would i uh, approach this problem the answer is simple i first take s1 with a low level of calculation because this is large system i took s2 which is an intermediate size so i would take an intermediately expensive uh, uh, computational method to do this and finally s3 which is the system of i mean of maximum interest so i spend maximum computation power for this system because here quantum mechanics is necessary to give you an example i can do a molecular mechanics here i can do a let's say hatrifog theory here or a dft here or i can do a hatrifog theory for s1 dft for s2 or couple cluster for s3 it doesn't matter so i can choose any method so it's not necessarily qm mm it can be qm qm or it can be mmmm for example i have a polarizable force field for s3 and a non polarizable force field for s2 and all these possibilities but you would immediately see that i have done some over counting because s2 is also present here s3 is also present here so i should correct for them so that's very easy i take s2 and do a calculation at the lower level so that and subtract it so that this double counting is taken care i take s3 and do a calculation at the lower level that is in case here at the intermediate level and subtract that so in this way i 
architect took care of the over double counting. And at the end, what I have is each of these S1, S2, S3 have been treated at the met method of uh, my choice. Now I can extend it to N layers. So I have size S1, the large size S2, uh, smaller size Sn. So I, I can have many size and I can have many layers. So, uh, so L1, L2, L3, so that these are the different levels of calculation. So of course, when I have very large size, I can only do with a very low level calculation. When I have a very small size, I have a very uh, high level calculation. And these diagonal terms are the first additive terms. And then these uh, off diagonal terms that you see are essentially the sub terms that have to be subtracted from the immediately um, uh, next level. If I do this, I of course can go to the uh, target. So this, scheme called uh, the onion scheme. It has a, an abbreviation which should remind you of onion, that it is layered in, in, within layer, within layer, you can have as many layers within this. So this is the uh, power of subtracting method. Practically speaking, two layer method is, is most popular. Three layer method is also used, but rather let's say occasionally. Beyond three, it is in principle possible, but in practice, uh, no one uh, perhaps does it. All right, now we go to the additive scheme. In the uh, problem with the subtractive scheme is, as I said, that I had to do this MM calculation twice because I'm, I'm doing, a, I'm being forced to do a molecular mechanics calculation even in this active site region. In the additive method, what it does is, is okay, you don't worry about this active site region because you anyway did not want to make that force field, so better don't make it. So do this MM calculation for the rest of the system. For this, uh, active site, just do a QM calculation and then add this up. But then you would see that when I add these two up, it is all right, but the interaction between the two is missing. And the third term therefore I'm introducing is the interaction of the Q QM region with the MM and the MM region with the QM. This interaction energy, what takes it to a non-cooperative field. So it's just not addition of an MM energy with a QM energy, QM energy, rather it also has an interaction between the QM region and MM region. Now, how do I take care of these interactions? Conventionally, we decided that all these interactions will be taken, uh, will be treated in terms of, uh, uh, in, in classical way. So the, all the interaction energies can be divided into two groups. One is the non-bonded type of QMMM interaction. Another is the bonded type of QMMM interactions. We'll come to each of, each of these terms because the definition, the, the way that the magnitude or the definition of this interaction energy will actually depend on how we have defined our boundary. We see we have defined a QM region and an MM region, but how, where is that boundary? The boundary can be thought of as two different ways. One is through space boundary, another is through bond boundary. What do I mean by through space boundary? Suppose my QM region and MM region do not have any covalent bond in between them. So there is a protein and there is a ligand. The ligand is a free molecule, which was for moments uh, earlier, which was outside the protein, but it has come and into, uh, got into the active site of the, um, of the enzyme. In that case, there is no direct covalent bond between the ligand and the, and the enzyme. So there is the boundary between the, if I want to consider only the ligand as QM and the rest of the protein as MM, in that case, the boundary between the QM and the MM region is through space. There is no bond that is defining the boundary. But in case I want to break a bond to define my boundary, uh, then that would be called through bond boundary. We'll come to through bond boundary in a moment's time, but let us first look at the through space boundary. So here, for example, here I have a ligand and the side chains of the proteins are shown in the red, the ligand is shown in the blue. So my bound, I am taking the blue region as the, the QM region and the red region as the MM region. The protein is in MM, the ligand is in QM. In this case, you see that there is no bond breaking. So this region is free from any uh, bond breaking or bond from formation with, with respect to the side chains of the protein. In that case, when the boundary is through space, my QMMM interaction energy, there is bonded terms and there is non-bonded terms. Since there is no bond which is breaking, so I have no bonded terms, so I have only 
to worry about the non-bonded terms. So therefore, EQMMM, the interaction energy, is simply QMMM, non-bonded interaction energy. Now, how do I get this? When non-bonded interaction energies are given in terms of two terms. One is the steric term, which is given by the standard Leonard John potential. You have seen this uh, in, the, in the force field. Only thing that you have to remember here, I and J, the atom indices, I belongs to the, an atom in the QM region where I have N QM number of QM atoms and N MM number of MM atoms. So I belongs to one of these QM atoms, J belongs to one of these MM atoms. So I am talking about the interaction between the blue and the red not blue blue not red red because blue blue interaction happens only with qm red red interaction happens only with mm i'm talking about the interlayer interaction so therefore i'm talking about i is blue j is red all right so the Len the steric terms of the Leonard Jones terms depend on this uh, the, the sigma and the epsilon parameters which are part of the force fields so it is normally conventional even for the QM atoms, also you take if it is a carbon atom, nitrogen atom, you simply take the uh, Leonard Jones parameters corresponding to those uh, those atom types in the in the steric term. Then you have the electrostatic term. Of course, here the distance, which is anyway going to be computed uh, based on the particular conformation. What we have here is the charges QI and QJ. QJ J is the charge of one of these mm atoms. You already know from your force field that the atom uh, has a partial charge. Now this QI is the charge on one of ith QM atom. How do I get this? This is uh, quite tricky to get or the, uh, a lot depends on how accurately I get this QI because this QJ are obtained from force field and I how do I get this QI because I decided to take this from a quantum mechanical calculations. So now uh, we'll discuss about how we, different ways we can do this electrostatic coupling or this first term. The second term is standard. No, uh, there is only uh, one popular way to be done. The first term, the electrostatic term, how can we do electrostatic coupling schemes? What are the different schemes? And in, in general, we want to know how I can get this QY. The first approach is the so-called mechanical embedding scheme, where you can just take a value of QI. QI. You can simply decide to take force field charges even for the QM atoms. Or you can simply do a QM calculation, obtain a wave function, thereby a density, and convert it to a molecular electrostatic potential, break down this molecular electrostatic potential, and obtain the partial charges of this. So from QM calculation itself, I can get a QM charge, and I can plug this in this charge. But remember here, when I'm doing this QM calculation, I do not have any MM region over here. It's only the isolated QM system. So therefore, the QM system, with the charges that I'm getting is not, again, polarized by the, the surrounding. So this is called mechanical embedding because I am mechanically putting the QM region. The other approach is the electrostatic embedding scheme, where again, I do the same. I try to obtain the QM charges the way I did before. That means I solve this Schrodinger equation, get the wave function, get the electrostatic potential, convert it to point, um, uh, partial charges. But while I am doing this, I in my Hamiltonian, in the electronic Hamiltonian that, that I discussed, I add another term. And that term I, is point charges corresponding to all MM atoms. So that when I'm solving this Schrodinger equation, I'm not only solving this electronic part of the Hamiltonian, but also another term which comes from the point charges corresponding to each of these nuclei, which I have considered in the MM region. So that way what happens, this wave function when I'm getting is aware of the presence of the surrounding charges. So therefore the charges that I'm going to get here is influenced by the external point charges. So therefore this charge is kind of polarized by the surrounding region. And this is what we want. We, we know that the enzyme is there for a purpose. So this purpose has been satisfied to a great extent when I include these point charges in my Hamiltonian, because that will polarize my QM region, the charges, the energies that I'm going to get is going to be more accurate or going to be more realistic. But this electrostatic embedding scheme is, is rather expensive compared to mechanical embedding scheme. Now there is a third approach, which is not very popular because you can see the in this, both the cases, I'm trying to get better QM charges, 
but I am being silent about this MM charges. I'm just taking force field charges. It may happen that the QM region can also back polarize the QJs. So in that case, what I have to do is that I have to take a polarizable force field. So this is called polarized embedding scheme where QM region can influence the MM region and MM region can back influence the QM region. So we have to do this iteratively and it's going to be extremely expensive. So this is even now it's not commonly practiced. The uh, gold standard uh, the, the, in the recent times is the electrostatic embedding scheme. All right, so, so much so far we discussed about the through space boundary where the QM region and the MM region are separated through space. There is no bond which is linking them. But now suppose I want to introduce a different uh, QM scheme. Suppose for some reason I say that, okay, this part of the ligand is very important, whereas this part of the ligand is not that important. So I want to treat this in molecular mechanics, only this part in quantum mechanics. In addition, I say, okay, all these residues are there, but they're not very important. However, this residue is very important. This part of the residue is very important. So I also want to consider them in quantum mechanics. Remember this, all these residues are part of a single protein chain. So if I take one, I have to take all other unless I decide to cut a bond. So therefore now my boundary becomes through bond. That I'm breaking a bond or I'm cutting across cutting a bond to define my QM region and MM region. So in this case, the EQMMM, the total interaction energy will of course have the bonded, non-bonded term because I still have non-bonded non -bonded interaction. But in addition to that, which is non-bonded is exactly the same that we discussed earlier, uh, the electrostatic, uh, <clears throat> whether I do it with mechanical or electrostatic embedding doesn't matter, or plus the, uh, the steric term, so these are there. In addition to that, I also have some bond data. Now, how do I treat these bond data? You see, uh, when I break this bond, uh, still the interaction between these two, I can consider because these are one, one partner of this bond is in M QM region, other is in MM region. So therefore I can in include this bonded term as my QMMM interaction, so E bond. So if I have included this bond, so you can see one, two, three, this angle also, uh, comes uh, in two different region, one in uh, QM as well as MM. So this is also another interaction energy. Similarly, you can have many torsion. So all these terms which are bonded uh, otherwise can also be included into this uh, E interaction energy. So I have bond angle or torsion. So all these are treated as a classic in, uh, at classical or molecular mechanics level. Okay, so now what, uh, when I do this system, I would see that I'm go going to do a quantum mechanical calculation on this system, this part, this part, plus this blue region where I have broken. Now, when I have broken this system, so just let's consider this ligand, blue ligand. So this is my initial ligand. I said, all right, I this is my uh, non-important region. This is my important region. I want to consider this quantum mechanically. I want to treat this molecular mechanics. So when I'm doing a QM calculation, of course, this region is not present. So I'm hiding it. When I hide it, you would immediately see that there was a bond here. This carbon's valency is not satisfied because this carbon was supposed to have tetravalency. So this is part of a, uh, an aromatic ring. So uh, it requires another, uh, it has got one unfulfilled valency here. And what do I do this? Otherwise it has a, got an extra free electron. The famous octet rule is not satisfied and it becomes a radical. When I do a quantum mechanical cis calculation on this kind of system, where there is an extra unpaired electron, this electron can get delocalized over the system and it can cause mayhem there. So I must take care of this free electron because the free electron is, is, is called a radical. As you know, the, uh, the English the meaning of radical, what it is. So the radical can radicalize the entire, entire system. So I want to uh, neutralize that part. What do I do? So what I do is that how do I treat this dangling bond in the QM region? So this is the, uh, the famous dangling bond problem. One uh, approach is that whenever there is a free radical over there, one unpaired electron, so just add one hypothetical link atom of one hydrogen atom, because once you add an hydrogen atom here, so there is a CH bond over here. The molecule is now uh, octet rule satisfied. There is no loose electrons going around here. But mind you, this hydrogen, where would I place it? So I normally place this hydrogen uh, somewhere along this line where the carbon
place somewhere near this uh, near the uh, closer to the carbon so i treat this hypothetical system in qm so when i say i am doing a qm calculation i often consider this link atom into this satisfy the valency and then do a qm calculation so this is an important step in doing any qm uh, mm calculation all right uh, let us discuss what is what is a typical workflow in a qm mm calculation uh, in the morning session all these things have were discussed so you first uh, to uh, define an md simulation so you, you essentially do everything that you did uh, for an md simulation you download a pdb from the data bank uh, often the pdbs are um, having missing hydrogen atoms especially if they are from extra crystallography uh, so add those hydrogens there are sometimes some loops will be missing because of their uncertainty so you have to model those loops loops all these standard things that you do from a classical simulation point of view you do that you solve it the system you put a uh, water box around it you neutralize the charges you add salt to your uh, test um, and then after doing all these things you generate a topology file or the definition as to which atom is linked to which atom what is the force field all these informations are there in this topology file once you have this you do a classical simulation standard steps you do minimization because this, there will be many bad contacts you do a heating because the crystal structure was taken at very low temperature you want to simulate it in physiological temperature so you heat it up and you equilibrate it because uh, the you are you have added a, a lot of kinetic energy you need some time to equilibrate the, that energy so you do this equilibration energy after all these things are done you can also do some uh, equilibrium uh, md simulation after that you select a snapshot all this were standard molecular dynamic strategy now starts what new we can do for the qmmm so you select a snapshot and then start your qmmm modeling first thing is that you have to define a qm region how do i define a qm region so i say that in most of the molecular dynamics programs you would have a, an idea about how to select certain atoms certain residue so through that you can either by residue or by atom you can select and define your qm region once you define in qm region you have to delete that region from your mm because you remember we are if you are doing additive you have to remove that from mm region so you need to create a new topology file for the mm region by ex excluding this qm region atoms and that is for the mm part what about the qm part so you have to do, create a qm protocol first of all you need the coordinates or the z matrix or in the cartesian form the coordinates of the uh, the position of each of these atoms remember we are solving within von oppenheimer approximation so this position is 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 fixed now we took it and uh, define our atoms at those position we define the overall charge and spin multiplicity because when we solve the electronic schrodinger equation uh, we can uh, since the uh, hamiltonian doesn't have explicit explicit spin so it commutes with the uh, spin operator so therefore i i need to define my multiplicity whether it's a singlet spin state or a, a triplet or a quintet or a doublet or whatever the spin multiplicity requires to be defined and overall charge of the system suppose you have an aspartate or a glutamate or arginine or lysine or if your ligand has charge so you have to define the charges otherwise you end up in wrong results this after this you have to define your method whether you want to do hatrifog dft mp2 uh, depending on what all you can uh, afford or what you require and mostly most likely you are going to uh, many cases people use dft so if you are using dft you also have to talk about the functional uh, dft has uh, many many functionals we have a slide later on up to talk about some good practices in qmmm calculations uh, dft has many functionals so you need to know which functional you should take now the the last case is the basis set what is this because every time i define an atom i have got these electrons and these electronic functions or the total wave function of the quantum mechanics uh, qm system will be expressed in terms of this basis set so these are the initial function basis functions that will be used as a linear combination to express my final wave function so this basis set also needs to be carefully uh, uh, chosen but a few simple rules if you follow uh even without uh, getting to know a lot of details you still can manage to do a, a meaningful qmmm calculation all right uh so what happens in a typical uh, qmmm calculation so this is a workflow but suppose i do a qmmm calculation what way uh, what happens behind the screen so i take took an md snapshot uh, the first of 
is do an mm job um, by mm job i mean you have the force field you calculate the total potential energy and if you have the energy you already saw in the morning that how you can calculate the force as the negative gradient of the uh, the the potential energy so you have force on each of these atom so atom j is from a classical mm region atom so you do an mm job and get the mm energy and as well as the uh, forces on the mm atoms the next step so this part you can do with a standard mm program for example uh, um, there are many namd chromax amber uh, all these programs in one of these two uh, programs you can do now the next step is uh, although they are not linked uh, separately uh, you are doing a qm job uh, on the qm region with your mm atoms as point charges so you have you have a small size of qm region which are being explicitly treated but all other mm atoms are present in your hamiltonian as as point charges and you do that qm job when you do that qm job you essentially get a quantum mechanical energy you once you have this potential energy you can also generate the forces on each of these qm atoms i am calling this qm atom as i so you have obtained these forces on qm atom you have the wave function from this qm job the electronic hamiltonian you solve so therefore you have the electron density and from there you can get the partial charges on the qm atom these are the standard things that you need the forces the partial charges plus if you need any other physical classical observable corresponding to that you can bring in your upper corresponding operator and get the expectation value because once you have the wave function getting the expectation value is is, is very easy so these are the standard things that you do in, in qm and you can do this qm calculations using any qm program for example gaussian or turbomol mol molcas orca uh, whatever your your uh, preferred uh, program uh, you do this qm you did this mm now the uh, time comes that to make them interact with each other so the qm mm interaction so you have your qm mm bonded in energies the steric energies the electrostatic energy depending on whether you are doing mechanical or electrostatic embedding you will have your uh, electrostatic energies uh, as uh, different so once you have these energies so these are the additional energies to be added to uh, emm eqm to this in addition now you have new forces because you have forces on molecular mechanics forces within the quantum mechanics because now you have additional energy terms potential energy terms so you have additional forces on all these atoms so you have got this qmmm forces on atom i which is an qm atom coming from the mm region similarly you have a new force on atom j which is an mm atom coming from the qm atoms so these are the new forces on qm region or mm region atoms because of the other regions these calculations you to do these calculations you need a third set of pro, uh, programs let's say call them a qmmm assembler which can interact with the uh, qm program with your mm program so a third program is sometimes needed we'll come to that uh, that part little uh, later but this is a new task that you have to do you have to add get additional forces uh, from the qmm once you have got all your energies as well as forces you can simply follow the classical uh, newtonian's uh, equations of motion you can get the new structure from the forces and the coordinates of the last run so you have the previous coordinates you have got the new forces so you did from this you get the new structure and once you have the new structure again you go back and do this mm job qm job qmmm new structure mm job qm job and you can go on so just like a mol standard molecular dynamic simulation you can also do a molecular dynamic simulation within qm mm approach now when i do a qm mm calculations what are the scopes what all calculations can i do first thing that are uh, most important things that people often use is to describe thermodynamics and kinetics you see that we are obtaining the gradients the forces so the first derivative of the energy is na is up being obtained so therefore if i am obtaining the first derivative of the energy so i can always progress along the uh, high uh, the largest slope and find out those geometries where the energy is minimized so this geometry optimization or finding the most energetically stable geometry is a very important question in chemistry and within qmmm of course you can do geometry optimization because already you know that i am getting anyway my forces once i get the gradient so the uh, 
you will i'll have to use some optimization algorithm to go down the energy surface that is one important thing the other thing that is necessary for kinetic is to talk about the transition states the barriers of a particular reaction that will define whether the a particular by enzymatic reaction is kinetically favorable or not so i can get the transition stress so grand transition states are the highest energy point in a, in a potential energy surface where uh, there are uh, 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 certain rules to be satisfied uh, so where we have to check actually the not only the first derivative of energy but rather the second derivative of energy because it has to be the energy maximum right so it has to be uh, in it has to be maximum along um, all direction except except for one and that transition state has to be uh, can can also be obtained so therefore thermodynamics and kinetics related questions can be answered next is that spectroscopy now you see when i have a qm calculations i can generate energy or force uh, forces on any excited states although this is not very popular but i still can do all those qm methods that i can use for the excited state calculations i can use them here and get my electronic absorption or emission spectra uh, for example for fluorescence uh, spectroscopy in, in biomolecular systems i can track uh, i can uh, address this kind of problems i also can look at nmr uh, spectra so these spectroscopic applications are also possible through qmm calculation in addition the strength of the molecular dynamic simulation is its ability to do conformational sampling so you can see i can do equilibrium qm mm md sampling so that means hybrid qm mm but molecular dynamics type because i am every time i am getting a set of force i am generating a new structure that gives me a new set of force and uh, so on so forth so therefore i can run a long trajectory simulation to sample the phase space as i do in the Q, uh, md calculation uh, i am not sure whether it was uh, discussed in the previous cal um, uh, talks that using your md simulation you can also sample non equilibrium processes there are some special uh, methods for example umbrella sampling or steered md so if uh, these are very popular in uh, molecular dynamics uh, literature if you can do this with molecular dynamics you can very well also do that with the qmm md so these are the different scopes that, that means you can um, study a uh, high energy uh, high barrier process through non equilibrium process a non equilibrium uh, molecular dynamics method using qmm uh, approach now uh, the choice of software and hardware because you see the uh, while it is uh, important to know what are, what are there uh, in what steps have to be done to do these calculations uh, but these are all very involved programs and it it would take you years to if you want to rewrite these programs and good for luckily uh, for us there are many standard uh, softwares which are um, which which we can use to do this uh, this calculation for example for your mm programs you have charm namd amber gromax lamps uh, there are several qm programs you can do that and then as i was telling there are qm mm assembler for example cam shell being uh, one of the most prominent example which neither does a full mm calculation not does a full qm calculation but it interacts with the qm region collects their forces interacts with the mm region collect their forces helps you prepare the next step and sends you to mm sends the calculation for qm so this can be done by a third party program uh of late you would see that most of these md programs and also some of these qm programs have also started introducing the other part for example amber now can interact with gaussian thermal uh, very easily gromax does uh, uh, good uh, interaction with with cp2k and other other programs so uh, gaussian for example has a as an inbuilt onium program with which you can do qm mm on its own uh, similarly uh, qchem has a very good uh, qm mm uh, module in, inbuilt in it so there are several ways either you can use third party afflet whatever your favorite program is you check whether that particular program also has an interface with uh, qm mm uh, calculations so this is about the software now what about uh, the hardware Uh, when we do a standard qmm calculation uh, the percentage of computing time that we spend uh, can be roughly described by uh, this uh, this diagram of course this is a uh, this is an indicative diagram the real uh, distribution will depend on your size of the qm system the accuracy of the qm system uh, but from my experience more or less most meaningful qmm calculations follow this trend 
that majority of your time goes in doing this QM calculation, this threes region, the MM calculation, as well as the QMMM, uh, the communication uh, barely takes any time. You would not even notice that. But the bottleneck is actually the QM time. Now, since this is the scenario, we have to be a little careful because most MD software are GPU enabled. So if I'm using, for example, Amber or Gromax and AMD, I'm going to use GPU because I can run very long trajectory in a very short period of time. Unfortunately, most of the QM software, at least uh, as of now, are not GPU enabled. And even, even though some had uh, uh, GPU enabled uh, um, programs, but still uh, they do not support all forms of calculations and they are, they are also not very, uh, easy to use. So at, at least at, for the time being, the QM softwares are not, not really uh, GPU friendly, but they beautifully scale up to many, uh, like let's say 20, 40 core uh, processors, uh, 20, uh, 20 or 40 processors, they can easily scale up if you are taking only CPU. So since most of your time goes anyway in the QM calculation, so if you are running a QM MM calculations, it is best that you run through uh, the, the CPU. All right. Uh, I think I have got uh, five more minutes. Is it uh, correct? Uh, yes, Professor Mishra, you can continue. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll finish it in, in this five minutes. So I just have a few uh, uh, final remarks or uh, uh, helpful comments if you decide to do QMMM calculations, a few special attention. Uh, one tricky thing is that size of the QM region. Uh, no matter what they say, here at least the size does matter. Uh, for If your QM region is large, it's always going to help. But it's not merely the, merely the size, rather the judicious choice of the size which is going to help. There are some cases where people do start from the active site region and radially expand your QM region, thereby include everyone in a, in, a, in a fixed amount of radius, all the residues, that way you end up taking many non-important uh, residues. It is better to do a judicious choice as to see which residues are there and how I can introduce them so that you can minimize your computational, uh, computational cost while increasing the accuracy. Like the balanced diet, here also never forget the water. Many times what happens, we put all our attention in a biomolecular simulation on the amino acids or the side chains of the protein, but we often forget the water. And we know what happens when we in our diet do not have water. Uh, this also happens in, in, the, in this QMMN calculations. Oftentimes you see that by simply adding a few water molecules at proper places, your calculations become smoother, they converge better, uh, the, res the results improve. So. Do not forget the water. Always do a careful investigation about uh, where the water molecules are and how you can inter, inter, uh, include them in your QM. Uh, the QM method of choice, this is actually uh, not much of a choice. If you have a reasonably large size of QM, DAP is almost uh, the only uh, option. Although there are uh, now uh, several, uh, for example, uh, RI MP2 or there are uh, other you know, variants of CCSD methods which are coming up, but DFT is, is one of the most uh, popular method for your uh, QM method. And if you are doing excited state calculations, of course, you can do TDDFT, which is the time dependent version of DFT or CASACF or uh, uh, UM CCSD, depending on what uh, the choice of your interest. Uh, DFT care, so when you are doing a DFT calculation, make sure that you have hybrid or a meta hybrid functional, or even in many cases, GGA functionals also would be okay. Uh, in addition to the uh, functional, uh, most uh, in recent days, most of the cases you would see that people are using hybrid uh, functional. So that's not much of a concern. What is still a matter of concern is the lack of dispersion correction. Uh, uh, luckily over the last few uh, years, this dispersion correction is, is becoming uh, more uh, popular among, among the researchers. So always make sure that you are including the dispersion correction. There are some empirical ways of including them. That also does, does a very good job with very little extra uh, computational cost. So if you are doing a DFT, uh, never forget to uh, include the dispersion correction. Uh, the basic set, I unfortunately did not uh, describe you what all uh, they can do, but those of you who do this calculation or those of you know, uh, at least use a double zeta basis 
plus polarization. This polarization is extremely important. If you have an anionic system or a negative charge somewhere in your system, uh, in your QM region, uh, you, you are advised to use a diffused function for that. If you have heavy atoms or metals, then always consider relativistic uh, effective pot uh, pore potentials. The other important uh, uh, con concern is that the time, time step and shape. Normally, uh, the time step of integration in a standard QMM, uh, standard MD simulation is one frame per second. But if you are using this shake algorithm, which actually constrains the uh, carbon hydrogen and uh, carbon hydrogen bonds, in those cases, you can go and do a time step of, uh, of two frame per second so that your calculation becomes faster. Uh, that you can do longer trajectories at, at, at shorter, uh, at less time. Uh, but in case of QMMM, it is often advisable that since you are uh, often in your case, QM region will have hydrogens, which are in, considered in the, in the quantum mechanics and they are going to uh, uh, evolve during your uh, simulation. So it is, you can choose whether you want to put a shake in your QM region or not, you still can Keep your shake in your MD region, classical region, but check carefully whether you can have, uh, if you can leave out the shake within the QM region. And the, if you are leaving out the shake, then make sure that the time step is at least one femtosecond and advisable, it is uh, uh, 0 0.5 femtosecond is, is, is even better. All right, so uh, uh, this is, uh, I had uh, a few application in my mind, but then that's not really, uh, very helpful. So with this, I come to the end. Uh, I have uh, listed uh, here a few papers. I must admit, I made this uh, presentation extremely qualitative because I am aware of the diverse uh, background of the audience. Uh, but some of you um, might have uh, might be able to understand uh, more about this, if, even if I go uh, to greater details. Uh, for those uh, people who can or who are interested, uh, please follow uh, these uh, few papers. They are, they are uh, extremely uh, useful papers, heavily cited papers. And I would also recommend this uh, BioExcel uh, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, this BioExcel is the leading European center of excellence for computational biomolecular research. So they have a channel. Uh, they have a uh, yeah. They have a channel which is, is on best practices in QMM and simulations. Uh, so there are eight or nine uh, one-hour videos where various aspects of the QMM calculations uh, are, are being described by the uh, leading experts in the in the in the field. So. I would strongly recommend these videos for you. And if you have any question, if you have any queries, you are, you are of course encouraged to ask now. And in case you want to contact me and have more questions, you can always reach me at this uh, web, uh, the, the email address. And finally, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, thank you, Professor Mishta. You can uh, probably mail this last slide to me so that I'll uh, share it with the participants later. Sure. Uh, yeah. But now, participants, if you have any question, you can please raise your hands. Mm. Okay. Wait, wait a minute. Uh, Gaurav Bhattacharji, you can unmute yourself and ask question. Hello, can you yes. hear me? Yes, yes, go yeah. ahead. Uh, hello, sir. It was a great lecture. Thank you. I was looking forward to learning this QMMM methods. Uh, sir, I have a question. I, I mean, uh, uh, as I uh, heard that the proton transfer reactions are monitored by this QMMM methods, or maybe some zinc uh, uh, in zinc anhydrase, uh, those uh, some water molecule transfer, those uh, those. Uh, phenomena can be monitored by QMMM methods. My question is, how, uh, how much large can we go? I mean, how much large group transfers can we monitor by these QMMM methods because of the computational cost involved with it? Okay, uh, so uh, I'm in luck because uh, uh, I'll just show you this one over here. Uh, this is actually a proton trans uh, transfer. So here it is. Uh, this is your uh, water molecule. This is a uh, yeah, glutamate. So the glutamate activates this water molecule. So you will see this proton getting uh, 
shift, shifted to glutamic uh, acid at the end, resulting your OH minus. Yeah, here the reaction happens. Uh, so uh, this calculation was done with uh, just a second. Uh, I, yeah, the red, the QM region had 112 atoms, including the 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 systems that I showed you there. So it had 112 atoms, and with an uh, this is the trajectory where this uh, proton transfer is happening. So it's a five picosecond uh, simulation. There are four simulation, each of five picosecond. Uh, since the initial snapshots were actually carefully chosen, so they happen to be reactive snapshots. So therefore, in all four uh, trajectories, we saw the transfer of uh, the proton transfer happening at different times. So one picosecond to let's say three or four uh, picosecond. So you can see the hydrogen has gone and then uh, this glutamic acid has formed. Uh -huh. So uh, the computational cost, you see that if this is five picosecond, uh, this was done uh, three, four years ago, five years ago at, at least. So with time step of 0.5 femtosecond, mm -hmm. thousand steps, in a 16 core, uh, this machine takes about uh, one week. So this would be, uh, so thousand steps means um, 500 femtoseconds. So this is 5,000 femtoseconds. So yeah, so 10 weeks, one trajectory. So three months, one trajectory. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank this you. This is quite expensive. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh... Who else is there? Uh, the next person can ask question. Go. Is that code of is over? Sorry. Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, ne the next person can ask the question. Uh, sorry, you may ask uh, question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, sir, can you just suggest some uh, open source tool uh, for uh, QMMM simulation? Uh, yes. Uh, for, uh, yeah, let's, uh, for example, if you do go to Gromax here, uh, yeah, Gromax is open source and it uh, it also links to, let's say, with, uh, together with CP2K, you can uh, do that. So that is possible. It is there. And uh, I, I'm not very sure, but uh, maybe with Orca also, you can call this, uh, let's say, Gromax and do that. Um, but I'm not sure. OK, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. OK. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, ne next, next person can ask question. Everybody is raised hand. Sanatan, you can ask question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Shantanab Mujumdar. I'm on the uh, experimental field now, uh, basically on transition metal dichalcogenide, and I'm very new to the theory world. Uh, so, sir, uh, I want to uh, just concentrate on the DFT part. So, sir, can you please suggest me the, uh, how to start with DFT studies? And uh, uh, like I am working on gas absorption on NOS2 surfaces. I am doing uh, gas uh, uh, since. Yes. Yeah, so, which group uh, or which uh, sub? Uh, yeah. Uh, so to get uh, started with this, I mean, you can, uh, if you have access to some of these uh, commercial software, that is all right. If not, then I would recommend uh, Orca as a, as a free uh, software, which can do uh, you know, DFT calculations. And uh, for if you are interested in uh, the background of the, the, the uh, methods, so there are uh, several um, books, for example, uh, the book by Kramer, uh, Christopher Kramer, and also his YouTube channel. So um, that, that also you can uh, check. They're nice, beautifully explained videos uh, about the background. And if you want to get started with this, I would re recommend that, for example, you if you are using Orca program, then you just uh, go through their user forum and they have a beautiful tutorial, so you can do this. Uh, initial, there will always be a little bit of uh, initial uh, hiccups, initial problems it is better if you can um, um, approach someone who can uh, guide you at the beginning so your learning 
uh, will be a little smooth. Uh, even if there is no one to help you out, still you can do self-learning. It will be slightly difficult, but not not impossible. Uh, but I would recommend if you know someone who can uh, do these DFT calculations, approach them, and if they, they, they help you, then you can just learn this and go ahead with your thing. Uh, Nilanjuna Mani. Am I audible, sir? Yes, go ahead. Okay. First of all, a very good presentation, sir. So, my question is that can I use this method to calculate some reactivity descriptor, like some local or global reactivity descriptors for a particular type of molecule? Uh, yes, you can. You can. I mean, I, uh, as you know, like the the reactivity de descriptors, they simply require uh, information about your uh, the frontier molecular or, uh, orbitals and their their composition. Uh, so therefore, you can, if you want to, let's say, consider the influence of the MM region on your uh, QM uh, region and then build that reactivity descriptor. Yes, very much. So as I said, so that will come under the any other properties that you have this. Uh, if you have the corresponding operator, you you can evaluate the property. Everything that you can do with QM, you shouldn't say everything, and most of the things that you can do with QM, you also can do with this. Okay, sir. So the model chemistries will have any impact on that uh, various reactivity descriptors? Which one will have? Uh, like the model chemistries, the basis set and the functionals. Oh, uh, I mean, uh, okay. Uh, I don't know. Are you asking in general, let's say, for a from QM uh, perspective or from the QM? I, mean, I answered it uh, thinking that you know how to do it or what all happens in the QM uh, calculation of a reactivity descriptor. And I'm ask, telling you that if you do it QM, MM, what would happen? What do you think? So you are asking that for only for a pure QM? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, sure. Yeah, it would it would uh, naturally have uh, that uh, that effect because you see the reactivity descriptors would uh, depend on the um, let's say your hardness or the hard or softness. Um, uh, so they they would depend on the composition of the molecular orbitals. So if I have larger number of basis functions, the molecular orbital composition is going to change. The molecular orbitals will have some inbuilt flexibility, and that will naturally uh, show its effect on the the activity descriptors. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other question from any other participant? Uh, <clears throat> sir, yes, sir, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, I, I am very beginner in this field, so I have a basic question that how I can understand in which cases I need a pure QM or a QM MM or a pure MM simulation. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, if it is a reaction, if there is a break, breaking of bond, formation of bond, uh, then you require quantum mechanics. Classical molecular dynamics will not help you. Uh, now, if the system is a large biomolecular system, let's let's an, an enzyme. So there, naturally, you cannot do everything with QM. So the enzyme with the solvent will have let's say hundred thousand atoms. So that those many atoms you cannot take in. QM. If your reaction is, let's say, one a small organic molecule reacting with another molecule, a simple Diels-Alder reaction, so there you don't require QM MM because the entire um, reactant species, all the reactant species can be described in quantum mechanics only. So there we do not require QM MM. Only QM is good enough. If I have an enzymatic react enzyme which is uh, catalyzing this particular reaction, then I require some atoms to be considered in MM, so there are some atoms in QM, so there I need QM MM. If I am not at all interested in an enzymatic reaction, I just want to know that, okay, this enzyme has, has this particular fold and how this, uh, let's say, how this particular uh, domain of this uh, enzyme moves uh, over time or when I change the temperature. For to address this kind of problems, you even do not require QM. So a plain molecular dynamics will, will work. Okay. Uh, any anybody else? Yeah. Uh, sir, I have a question. Yes, please Can go. Ahead. Uh, sir, uh, actually, I'm from experimental chemistry, but since last three four years, I am doing uh, DFT calculations in Gaussian. Yes, go ahead, please. No, no, no. I made a mistake. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Ah. 
Okay. Yes, Ila, Ila, please continue. Sorry, unmute your mic and continue. Uh, yes, sir. So I am from uh, an experimental chemistry background, but since last two three years I am doing uh, density DFT calculations uh, in Gaussian. So now I want to do CASS CF calculation. Which calculation, please? Uh, sir, CASS CF. CASS CF. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sir, how to go about this? Because like. I tried, but I could not do it okay. because my system have. Uh, sorry to interrupt. My system have uh, mainly three, five, or six membered benzene rings. Is uh, there a reason why you want to do a multi-reference method? Yes, sir. Uh, I have to calculate conical inter find out conical intersection. You want to find out the conical intersection. Uh, so you have interest in uh, doing uh, their excited state photophysical studies? Yes, sir. Because my area of research is that only. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So that 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 is clear. Of course, in those cases, uh, you some people have used uh, TDDFT, but uh, uh, that has often given uh, different. Uh, uh, kind of results. Uh, so yeah, in those cases, you have to do CASCF uh, or CASCF followed by CAS52 kind of calculations. Uh, so the question is like, how do how will you go about it? Um, unlike DFT, uh, the the CASCF is not a black box uh, method. Uh, the choice of like even before starting the calculation, you you need to know a lot about your system. So you need to do a few DFT calculations to learn about your orbitals and all. Uh, once you have uh, have an idea, you find out you know the chemistry that is going to happen in the the excited state uh, chemistry, both ground state as well as excited state. Find out all those uh, orbitals that are present that are likely to have a role uh, in your uh, excited state pathway that you are interested. Make sure all those orbitals are you are identifying those orbitals from, from your DFP calculations. You also make sure that uh, often if you are considering a pi orbital of one kind, you see where that where its antibonding orbitals are present. If they are not far away from the, 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 the um, active space region, uh, then do consider them in your active space. It takes a lot of uh, care and effort to construct your active space. Uh, so that part is, is the most challenging and it requires a lot of experience. And uh, uh, if, if the system, if a similar system has been studied in literature, you can look up and see what kind of active space orbitals have been considered there. Uh, but if it is a very new system, then it's going to be a very challenging task. Okay. But it's, it's, people do it, it's very rewarding, but you need to do it very carefully and it can be done, yes. Okay, so uh, let us thank Professor Mishta for his uh, beautiful presentation and uh, enlightening, interesting uh, discussion on how, uh, coupling quantum mechanics solutions with molecular dynamics methods. Uh, thank you, Professor Mishta. Thank you, Zumna. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And uh, we uh, cannot afford a break here because we are running a little uh, behind of the time. So I'll request our next speaker, Professor uh, Dr. Tamistra Pal, to present uh, her uh, demonstration on trajectory analysis using MD software. Uh, let, let me introduce her briefly. Uh, Dr. Pal is now a postdoctoral researcher in Center for Computational and Data Science. Her present work is focused on structural and dynamic aspects uh, of protein conformational changes in presence of ionic liquid and aqueous environment. Prior to this, she has been postdoctoral researcher in uh, Technische Universität Darmstadt, Germany, and uh, her research interests include uh, understanding complex structural and dynamical behavior of room temperature ionic liquid which from self assemblies in bulk and under confinement using coarse grain molecular dynamics simulation to investigate several other properties in complex fluids. Uh, she, she, uh, she will uh, discuss about, sorry, uh, she, she, she will give a demonstration on trajectory analysis methods in, in MD simulations. Uh, Dr. Pal, please start your discussion. Okay, uh, thank you Professor Rai for the wonderful introduction.
introduction. Uh, so um, I believe this is the uh, last uh, talk of this three day meeting. And uh, so for that reason, uh, what we will do um, like for the whole day uh, session, we uh, have learned that how computer simulations and uh, their detailed uh, theoretical background. So this current discussion for this next one hour and one, one hour 15 minutes would be mainly in line with uh, what we have learned and how we will use in really running a simulation. And for this, um, for example, um, here uh, we will be using a molecular dynamic simulation, which uh, basically acts as an efficient tool in the understanding of the behavior of simple to complex molecules. So uh, we already learned about uh, this in the last few talks, but I will try to briefly introduce it before going to more details about the technical things of how we run a simulation and how to uh, generate a trajectory and how to analyze the data. So first of all, what uh, MD simulation does is that uh, it gives a very time dependent behavior of the molecular system in terms of their structure and microscopic interactions. So how does that work? Uh, so basically the main framework is, let's say for example, we have an interacting system containing n number of particles and they interact via a, a model potential form which is given by this V for different particles which have coordinates like R1, R2 to n number of particles, that's why Rn. And therefore now if we solve the Newton equations of motion for such simple atomic system, we basically derive a force and this force is nothing but the uh, negative drag of the potential and in this way we calculate the effective force on a particle I which is basically a summation of all the forces that the particle I feels when it interacts with the surrounding medium and in this way we get the total force capital F and from here what we can do is we can estimate the constant accelerated motion of the particle. So, uh, so the theme is like here we have a particle whose uh, coordinate is like Ri at some time t. Let's say it's at the initial time when we have the initial particle coordinate at time t and we have a velocity for the particle. Then uh, with this Ri we basically can calculate the force. And this force uh, from equations of motion can give us an acceleration and this acceleration and velocity can give us the velocity for the next time step. Similarly, uh, the velocity and the present position of the particle can give us the position for the next time step. And in this way, we can iteratively keep on calculating the position of the particle and then the force and the velocity for the next time step. So MD is one of that ways in which we can get the full information about the classical many body systems and, uh, and that's why uh, we will um, use this in order to get the time dependent trajectory in order to understand and analyze their structure and uh, their motions in the system. So uh, first what is the scheme of doing this work. We probably have this uh, this uh, similar type of slide also in the previous talks where uh, our main framework is to initialize the system. We set up the initial velocities and positions of the particle. The velocities are given like if we give a room temperature like 300 Kelvin and we try to randomly generate the velocities on the particles using our maxwell Boltzmann distribution then we have the position of the particles, we have the velocities of the particles. Once we have this, we can compute the forces based on the potential model. And in this way, uh, we equate the equations of motions, we get the trajectory at every time step, which is the, for example, the nth time step, and we again go back and again cal calculate the force, and we keep on repeating this from time to time and we generate a series of coordinates, velocity and forces for every time step. So in this way, we already uh, also learned about uh, how with time the system has to be ergodic and what are the uh, basics of like, um, uh, like uh, how we can get that and that's mainly when we reach equilibrium at a long time, 
then basically the system tries to span uh, the particles, uh, try to span all over the space phase so that they are completely ergodic in nature and uh, in this way we can generate an equilibrium distribution of the particles. We reach an equilibration and then we finally get a production run. We save the data um, on our uh, disk and finally we use this afterwards for analyzing the different properties. So to perform this, uh, we will be mainly going into a more technical part and I will try to give you a glimpse of how a package uses this. For example, uh, we will be uh, using Romax, which is an open source package here for running the ship simulation. And uh, first we will start with a much more simpler water system. Then we will take a second example of a biomolecular system. And finally, I will leave one problem for you to do it afterwards. So in the first part, uh, we have to understand that what are the main file structure in Romax that Romax understands and the how, um, what are the, like mainly there are two aspects. The first one is the input file section and the output file section. So in the input files, we have uh, first are the PDB and the group files, which mainly uh, contains the information of the particle coordinates or the atom coordinates. So this kind of PDB structure is mainly can be downloaded from the protein data bank format and they for the proteins it can be downloaded from a site. We will talk about it afterwards. And for uh, much more simpler systems like water and so on, we have a group format of the file, which is like the Promax readable format for the coordinates of the atoms. Next is, as we understood from the previous slide, we first need coordinates. We need a force field, which needs to be defined in a kind of like uh, files. Uh, and that file in Promax is known as the topology file. So uh, the topology file is mainly contains like how many number of molecules and the atom uh, topologies like the charges, the mass, the radius of the atoms, how the molecules interact that is mainly comes under the section of the force field, the number of particles or solvent molecules that you may consider for your simulation and uh, like what are the types of interactions like if it is a bonded interaction, if it is a non-bonded interaction, uh, what are the angle definitions and the bond definitions used for that? The third part in comes in this uh, Romax input file is the MDP file. That is the molecular dynamics parameter file. So it is essentially very important file because this is where you get, give the inputs and the directions of how to run a simulation. And um, as um, uh, so basically what happens that uh, here you can change like at what temperature, at what time step you want to save the trajectory files and uh, like whether what kind of ensemble do you use, you basically can um, go and manually change the different directives in this file in order to give direction to Gromax to use it accordingly and run the simulation. And the last thing is a TPR file. So the PPR file extension is basically a file that includes all the information from the above files. That is, it has the information of, it sums up the information from the coordinate files. It sums up the information of what kind of potential you are using, uh, what are the system conditions you want to run the simulations, and so on. So with this, using this TPR file, basically you run the simulation and you get output files. The output files, as we know, is a set of trajectory files. They can be of two types. One is with a TRR extension and one is with an XTC extension. The TRR extension files is mainly the long version of the file where you have the coordinates, the velocity and forces, everything piled up. So basically this is a much larger in memory size. Whereas the XTC file is a compressed version of the file and it contains only the coordinates of the system. What else do we generate from simulation? There is one file which is the energy file. This comes with an uh, extension of EDR 
And this, all these files are basically binary files. You cannot open it. But you can use Chromex tools to use it for future uh, analysis, like um, checking what is the uh, potential energy of the system, what was the temperature of the system, what was the average box length of the system, and so on. You can usually use this um, file to make such, um, uh, to get some idea for that. And the uh, uh, other thing is the log file. So log file is like the time the simulation is running, the log file is, um, you can every time, this is a readable file, so you can every time open the file and look into what is the CPU time that means to finish the job or what are your system energies currently, what are the bond uh, interactions, the energies for that and whether your potential energy is going negative or it is positive and all those things you can give and get a detailed information in the log file. So basically it gives you the um, like of the flow of simulation you can see from there uh, on the go. And the final file is the CPT file, which is basically the checkpoint file. So the CPT file is also a very, very important file because um, with the help of CPT file, for example, if you, um, if the CPT file is, um, the, the checkpoint file is saved, for example, you want to restart a job, uh, the job has ended and you want to restart a job like after two days or sometimes, or you want to extend the job uh, to some other time limit. So basically you can use exactly the state point of the simulation and from here you can append all your trajectories to your previous file and keep on running for the next amount of time you want to. So basically this is a good file to restart your simulation. So um, now uh, more or less with this idea about the file extension that Chromex understands and uses and uh, the output files it gives. Um, now it's, um, we should also understand that Chromex uses this kind of system unit uh, for its uh, systems. The length scale is always considered in nanometers and the time in picoseconds. And the temperature is as usual in Kelvin and uh, the energies are in kilojoules per mole. So you have to be, when you go through afterwards, whenever you use Chromex, uh, I should always uh, suggest you to go through their online tutorials and manuals and uh, you should first check all the different kinds of um, different things that they have well documented there uh, and you must always be careful about using the correct units for the uh, for your simulation work. So, um, Am I audible? Hello? Yes, yes, you are audible. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically, um, uh, basically here in the fourth part, which is the structure file, so this is how it looks. For a glow file, if we see, uh, when we will do uh, some kind of uh, real example study, we can also see it, but let's um, check it out here. That for a grow file, it contains a, a kind of file which has a string and a header name on the top. And it, it, it mentions about like how many number of, for example, your solvent is water and you give it a name, which is a residue name as sol. So basically you have two sol molecules. So uh, there is the first molecule, which is 1, 1, 1. This is the residue number. This is the residue name. And here is the second residue and second uh, residue name. And uh, basically we have uh, hydrogen and uh, two hydrogen and one oxygen. So we have the oxygen, hydrogen and hydrogen. And, um, and therefore it makes it like total number for two sol molecules. We have total six atoms. And that's why in the second line, you are supposed to mention this, the total number of atoms. And on the first line also comes another, uh, uh, it also comes with another uh, line that it, uh, it mentions about the time step at which time this coordination file is created. Like if you open at different other time intervals, you will see it to be like 10, 20, 30. And definitely that is in picoseconds because we learned that it is given in picoseconds. So, after this, the next, uh, this next column stands for this number of atoms. And the uh, last three columns are mainly for the 
coordinates x, y, and z. And the final line stands for the box length of the uh, of of this simulation that we are taking, the row file. Uh, so it's basically that's the coordinate setup for the simulation. The box length is given at the last line. The next part after the structure file is the topology file. So in the topology file, uh, the topology file comes with the extension dot top. So uh, with this extension dot top, uh, if we open a topology file, then we will essentially see that uh, there are um, two files, namely it comes with the first field dot itp file. So basically a topology file um, under which uh, there are extensions which are the itp files and also um, uh, they, they are like uh, divided in this way that uh, it contains the force field dot itp which has contains includes with the hash uh, sign it includes the information of the force field dot non bonded parameters and force field dot bonded parameters and uh, for example this is a very simple case for a water model that we will take so uh, it includes all the force field information from the archive that Romax already has set up where all the ITP files and force files for different different force fields are already present there. One should keep in mind uh, that uh, there are already different types of force field that exists in, uh, in, uh, in uh, that's already exist, but uh, the parameters uh, like for the proteins and so on and for other Y molecules and polymers, there are force fields like amber, OPLS charms and so on. And uh, and what for water models also there are different water models that already exist in Romance. So uh, basically one can um, have to very judiciously uh, choose what kind of uh, system they are picking up and thus uh, what kind of force field uh, they should mainly use for their work. And for that uh, which water uh, model should be more compatible. So, um, so with that, uh, for this work, we will be mainly using, uh, since it is a test uh, run, so we will be mainly using the OPLS uh, stuff. And uh, for the OPLS model, uh, if you go to the Gromax repository, then you will find that they have a folder called top, which contains all the topology files uh, from Charms, Amber, Gromax, um, and, and OPLS and everything. So whatever available, they have it there. So um, in this uh, section, um, so mainly uh, if you open this, you will see that in this file, you will have, um, let me show you. So for example, for example, so here is the force field of water, which you can see on the right side of the slide. So first you, you include the OPLS, uh, even without OPLS also because it's a normal SPC water, you can get it. But um, we, we picked up from the OPLS postman and we take the SPC um, ITP, the ITP files which includes all the topology parameters for SPC water. So in the topol.top file, we also need to uh, include two more informations. First is a system, the system, the name of the system which would be anything you set, that would be the name of the system which would be provided as a header for all, all your uh, output files. And also uh, the molecules, for example, the number of water molecules you take. So uh, here the number of water molecules we have taken are like 884 molecules. So it's like named under sol residue name and it's like 884 water molecules we take. So if we open now, uh, this force field uh, dot um, bonded and non bonded. So what do we find it here? So in the uh, mainly in the force field dot uh, uh, this is for the non bonded parameters. We mainly find here the atom name. So the atom name is since it is under OPLS. Uh, so you will be getting the atom names named as like OPLS underscore different atom names 1, 2, 500 and something so on. And uh, the atom types will be obviously different for different force fields you choose. So for OPLS for example this is CW, CR, the, there is uh, CR, CX and different nitrogen atoms. The terminal, uh, the C carbon, alpha carbon atom and uh, the terminal carbon atoms all will be differently named. So this is the atom type which is always different for different types of uh, force field you choose. Then there is a section for your atomic number. 
the mass, the charge. This is a P type which Promax usually use uh, for your particle type. Um, and, the, and there is something else, but it, uh, that's not important right now. So it's better to just state it like there is like particle type A. There is always like virtual sites which are designated as B. So it's not important for the uh, time being. So uh, there is this sigma, which are for the particle sigmas that are given here, all are in nanometers. And this is the excited. And uh, these values are usually entered here. If you see a whole list, this is the whole list of OPLS molecules you can find. So when you pick up not just water, water you basically don't need from here, but it's like if you pick up for any uh, normal protein molecules and uh, any other kind of uh, long chain uh, molecules. So um, you, you when you derive, want to derive all the topological informations, uh, so basically it uses up these files and to generate its own token file. And there is another uh, uh, section, which is the postal bonded section. So basically this is the non-bonded terms and this is the bonded terms. So for the bonded terms here, it carries all the information regarding the bonds between, for example, the oxygen, for example, the oxygen and the hydrogen. So uh, it defines like if oxygen and hydrogen atoms are bonded, then it has a function type, which is the normal bonding here. And it's uh, like B uh, is the, your bond length and KB is your bond constant. If you want to change it like to other um, thing like uh, most potential and so on, then basically you have to go, go and see into the Gromax manual. And there you can see there are different uh, functions also mentioned like two and three, which corresponds to that specific potential to be used. And accordingly, it sets up that specific B0 and KB values for that. Similarly, for the angles also, there are I, J and K because there are three atoms and uh, the angle it makes, uh, it's also defined by a function. And it, uh, here, it's uh, the normal theta and the k theta that we will use. Uh, we have seen this expression in the morning several times. So, um, so here, this k theta and the theta will be the normal degrees and the uh, normal angle constant. So in this way, um, this uh, if, if I can also show you. Here, uh, you can see that uh, first is the bonded section, then comes is a constant also section there because you want to, if you want to constraint the bonds, constraint the angles also, then there is a constraint section. There is the angle type section where you basically define all the angles and you have the vacuum section. So in this way, all uh, different possible uh, types of combinations of angles, balls and dihedrals, all the information are stored up there. So um, after this, uh, now we come to the main part. Okay, I must also show you something uh, that is important. Um, a force spill dot ITP, which I forgot to show you. So basically in this force spill dot ITP, it uh, contains this terms because phosphate dot ITP basically includes your non-bonded dot ITP term, your bonded dot ITP term, and uh, this is something else, but uh, it's uh, like for your SPC, or for example, your case SPC. And uh, so here um, you can define all the non-bonded functions. Uh, that is whether it should be Leonard Jones or Buckingham potential for the non-bonded terms. And what is the type of combination tools? So these numbers, all these numbers are very important because it's the type of potential form you want to use in your system. You have to set it one or two. It's up to your uh, system. So basically, you have to uh, go to your, uh, uh, you, you have to go to the manual and check it that which function type and what numbers, combination rule numbers actually correspond to which system. So basically, here it is the normal Leonard Jones type, and uh, after this, um, so the main strategy of the work is like here uh, we will first we will first generate a topology. So uh, generate a topology it means we have for example uh, let's say for example for water system it's uh, rather simple because you can create a water glow file either using a pack mold 
or you can just solve it this box and create a box size with like uh, some 200 or 800 number of water molecules and i already showed you that the topology file of water is uh, quite simple you already have been provided with an spc uh, itp and the uh, where you have all the informations of the bond angles dihedral of uh, bond angle and the bond length the sigma epsilon uh, and so on but uh, in the case of like uh, large systems like uh, proteins and other biomolecular system so what you can do is like in this case is what uh, it's usually done is uh, you have to uh, get the protein pdb which is uh, supposed to be downloaded from the um, from a protein bank website and there uh, once you download this file this pdb file is actually it contains all the informations uh, mainly, uh, it, it, uh, it contains all the informations like uh, the author name information, what are the, it's mainly the structure files, so it's experimental determined structure files, so what type of experimental uh, method has been used, whether it is express scattering and NMR, so all these informations, uh, the amino acid residues, number of amino acid residues, and um, how these molecules, uh, what type of uh, like secondary structures are present there, and if there are any missing hydrogens or residues, all the informations are basically given in the PDD file. So uh, what Gromax does, it has um, a several number of uh, these tools. So Gromax uses this uh, GMX PDB to GMX uh, option, where it uh, just um, uses this PDB file, downloaded PDB file, and it converts to a Gromax understandable Grow extension with the Grow file. It converts to that. And it also used some um, uh, like extra this kind of um, interactive terms, which are like whether the your terminal ends of the protein or your molecule has to be capped or you have to ignore the hydrogen atoms, which are um, which are obtained from your NMR or X-ray structure. And you can basically ignore this and you can replace this with the phosphyl hydrogen types of your choice. So this is basically the uh, first part of creating the topology. So once you run this, you basically get a glow file, you get a topology file, and you get a position restraint file. So position restraint file is mainly useful for protein-like molecules where in the system you want to uh, fix the molecules with heavy forces on, on the, on the uh, heavy atoms and forces on the atoms, heavy atoms. And uh, that's why you keep the uh, protein molecule rigid at the first time before equilibration starts. And once uh, the solvent molecule gets equilibrated, then again we let the protein molecule be flexible and uh, we adjust to the uh, environmental system. So this uh, this ITP file will be used afterwards, and it's already a part of this topol.top file, where it also comes as with a hash and it includes the postgres.it. In the next uh, step, we create a box. Once we have this grow file, now it's important that we have to generate a box and we generate a box, keep the protein in the center of the box and we do that using this G, uh, G edit form, GMX edit form. And once we do this, we basically have an empty box. It can be cubic, it can be orthorhombic. You can select it according to your choice. So, uh, or, or according to the protein shape of the protein molecule you want. Um, so basically, this after this creating this box, you have to solve it the system, right? So in this case, you for solving the system, you uh, you basically use this GMX solvent or GMX insert molecules where you just add the number of your solvents around it, and it's usually done with GMX solvent. And we will uh, like uh, like what are the Exactly commands used for this, we will come while doing the examples. But uh, just uh, to say that uh, this GMX solvent and insert molecules can be useful here to solve it the system. So now this first this initial system configuration is set up. Now the next step is uh, doing an energy minimization because uh, here some of the molecules inserted may be quite randomly placed and they need to be have to have, we need to have a very good initial configuration so that the system doesn't blow up in energy afterwards and the system doesn't, the simulation doesn't crash. So in that case, we uh, start to do this energy minimization using the stiffest descent algorithm. 
and uh, we uh, then uh, perform this um, this equilibration, do the production run, and finally get the trajectory from the production run. And this is finally used for various analysis of structure like this. So for uh, the first system, which is um, uh, we will take it like SPC water. So uh, in this uh, case, um, it, you, all the files could be provided to you after this uh, talk. So uh, basically, we uh, I have uh, made the folders where you have an SPC water and uh, all the input files are kept in the input folder and I have already run the data and kept it in different folders. But uh, I will give you just a trial run here uh, for something short to just show you how it works. So uh, first you have to uh, do the equilibration. Uh, you already have an SPC flow and uh, this is with 884 water molecules I showed you which are the sol molecules. There is an SPC ITP file and a topology file. So uh, while initializing, you have to um, do it. So I created a EM a file uh, which is folder where I kept um, I just performed its GMX ROM and uh, then I used um, this uh, MDP file which is your essentially your MDP file is all the input parameters would be supplied in your dot uh, MDP file and um, then you take the structure file which is your initial structure file which is your SPC dot pro. But uh, remember that GOMEX always um, has this flex to be used. The F file determines the uh, it's 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 the input parameter and uh, it contains uh, all the input parameters and it's minus F. For any time the, uh, the structure file as an input always comes with C. The topology file would come with uh, minus P and the output file we will name it as EM dot TPR. And just uh, to avoid any kind of mismatch, we will keep doing it with uh, basically the folder names EM uh, for NPT and NPT also. So uh, once you have this uh, EM top TPR, as we said that it basically contains all the information from your MDP file, your group file and your top file. So this is the final file which has to be run in the system and uh, we use GMX MDP ROM. Minus V is for the verbose, which means that uh, the, the total process of your simulation running will be shown up in the screen. And uh, it comes, uh, sorry, so uh, mainly here uh, this minus S comes for this TPR file. So when you use this, you mainly help it to run the simulation. And we uh, use this minus DFNM, which is the uh, default file name. We set it for uh, EM so that my output files, that is my grow file, my log file, my EDR file, and my trajectory file, everything will be with the name starting with EN. So once I have that, my next step would be to take this equilibrium, uh, this energy minimized configuration, and I will repeat the process with NPT ensemble. So for NPT ensemble, I want to run using this NPT.NDP, which are all kept in this input folder. I will take pick up this uh, energy minimized equilibrium row configuration. We'll use the top file. The top file remains the same because for my molecule, it's the same information that I'm always using. The only thing that would be changing is this MDP file and the grow files that I would be using. And finally, I will generate this NPT.TPR. So this NPT.TPR generated, uh, now uh, we just use the same process and we run the NPT simulation. So here I have uh, used uh, like short runs and uh, like one nanosecond run and, and then I created this NPT Pro and there are also other files like NPT log, EDR and uh, XTC or TRR files. But uh, just uh, we will pick up that, uh, that row file from there. But keep in mind that every time when you come from this energy minimization, you should always look into the log files to see whether your system potential energy is negative. Because here also you have to see whether the potential energy is negative. Because if the potential is energy is not negative, then basically it doesn't make any sense because your system is not uh, energy minimized and you get a wrong configuration. And if you start from a wrong configuration, then uh, you basically end up somewhere in a uh, wrong process of doing the simulation or sometimes your system will just not work. So, um, 
So uh, every time you get uh, the log files, you just open and uh, see what is your potential energy. And you also use the EDR files, which would be generated here, to check what is the uh, potential energy uh, fluctuations with time, what is the temperature fluctuations with time, um, and what is the pressure fluctuations, and so on. Uh, like the density fluctuations, you, you can see with uh, time. So uh, that you can do with the GMX um, energy uh, tool. Um, so after doing that, we again take this, uh, once the system is equilibrated, we again take this NPT grow file and we uh, use this for running the NPT ensemble. So for NPT ensemble, we use the same procedure. We take the NPT.mdp. We take the structure file from the pre equilibrated NPT uh, folder and we take the topology file, which is same as, um, as all the time, and we have the NPT.tpr, which contains all the information from the above three files. Once we have this, then we can just uh, uh, run it for like uh, the time period of here we have used it like 10 nanoseconds and it takes some amount of time and uh, we give the file names with NPT and these are saved in the folders. So let's see. So basically in the SPC folder, you will find this thing. So you will find it here. You will be provided this folders where you have this SPC, you have the input folder, you create this uh, in, uh, energy minimized NPT and the NPT. So here all the data are already pre-created. Uh, I will just uh, need those data afterwards for analyzing their uh, trajectory. So let me first show you how this input file actually um, uh, contains what are the things. So but first we have, uh, we already saw that there is a grow file uh, for the SPC water. I think once more. Um, so here we have, yes, for these are the number of atoms. This is a header. This is the number of atoms. And we have, this is like A84. Sol molecules and the box that is three. <clears throat> with this, uh, now we have a total file which says how many water molecules and uh, it takes all the information from SPC ITP and the first field of ITP. Okay, first field of ITP we have already seen. We will check with the SPC dot ITP how it looks like. So SPC dot ITP, see here it um, uh, it uh, contains this uh, this. You know, NR uh, exclusions, which the number of exclusions around these two bonds away. So uh, it, it, it is more important, like for this is just uh, like oxygen and water, for like it's more important for those molecules which have many bonded molecules. So for there, if you want to exclude like uh, the interactions between the molecule I and J, and if they are like two to three bonds away, then whether you want to consider it or not, that you have to include it here. So you have your mass, charge, and all the descriptions here. You have here the settles. The settles basically is already money predefined in the case of SPC because uh, what are sometimes um, if it is not defined as flexible, then it will automatically constrain the bonds using settles. And uh, here is the oxygen, which is always used one atom. Uh, the central atom uh, is uh, taken uh, for uh, the settles and it uses the function and this is the distance of oxygen hydrogen and hydrogen hydrogen and uh, so these are the ways uh, like the spc water model is uh, defined if you see uh, now the mainly the mdp files so first we look into the energy minimization dot mdp file so in the energy minimization dot mdp file we keep the molecule flexible so uh, because one, uh, we first want to uh, attain a uh, energy minimized configuration, we want it uh, uh, the, uh, a good uh, uh, like uh, displacement of the molecule so that it takes uh, its uh, uh, so that it uh, reaches an energy landscape where uh, the um, uh, it reaches a global minima and it's not stuck in any local minima uh, because when you make the molecules rigid, it, it, uh, then it cannot explore uh, the different possible uh, like orientations and so on. So there are the integrator steps. Uh, we use the steepest descent algorithm. The n steps we have used 200, uh, 2000 steps, and we have set the total energy. If it is above uh, 1000 for any atom, the total uh, force acting on this um, or on on any of the atoms, uh, be 1000, 
if it is less than 1000 then we will consider the configuration or else we will drop that and we will again look for some other positions in the uh, in the uh, in the phase space and uh, in this way we create uh -huh, the, here is the output file which is the trajectory file and uh, we write the configuration so this nxt out is your um, x is the coordinate output this is the velocity output and the force output so if you want this output files to be saved, you can mention how many number of steps you want to uh, define and there you can uh, see after how many steps you want to maybe save your data. There is also NST log that is the log file which contains the energy information and also the uh, NST energy uh, file which contains the energy information that it's a binary because it's a dot EDR file so you cannot open it. But the log file you can instantaneously check it uh, during the time of the simulation uh, itself. Um, so energy group is something like if your system here is a uh, uh, one component. For example, if your system is like uh, has uh, uh, two energy groups, and uh, if your system, uh, then in that case you can basically define this as uh, one component and the other component, and you can write it. Um, two parts and uh, you can basically get uh, all these values written in the form of groups in your energy file. So uh, the neighbor list is also uh, mentioned here in the morning talk we learned about the periodic boundary conditions how to uh, impose this cutoff values and uh, like how to uh, like get this neighbor searching neighbor list uh, how to determine those. So basically these are all those are uh, uh, related to neighbor list where you uh, set up that after every 10 time steps uh, you ask the system uh, of the box to uh, just uh, make grids and uh, in, in such all these grids around a central atomite you check around these grids how many number of molecules are present and uh, accordingly at every 10 time steps you upgrade your uh, list and from there you can actually calculate all your um, um, all the interactions for the short range interactions and uh, this is uh, this R list and R Coulomb is mainly for the electrostatic for, um, part where uh, you have this uh, particle mass evolved uh, type defined and uh, this is R Coulomb with the R Coulomb cutoff. Um, uh, as we know for the electrostatic interactions uh, they go beyond uh, a cutoff distance and uh, for that reason we uh, need a uh, we need some specific uh, special techniques like e world summation methods and particle mesa world where uh, they take the help uh, of uh, some um, screening the charges beyond a certain distance and uh, they use some real space and a Fourier space transformation where and uh, that's the way they you know, take the help of this sophisticated methods like particle mass and world method and uh, and uh, they define all these kinds of screening of this um, of this uh, long range interactions, and these are mainly comes under this uh, Coulomb type, uh, which is which may be evolved or PME, whatever you define, and the R Coulomb, and um, there is for this evolved method you, you have to give a Fourier spacing grid in the reciprocal uh, space and the PME order, and the R total is the relative strength of the evolved shifted potential. So this, all these things uh, in principle, even if you don't give the Gromax already takes uh, some of the detailed volumes, uh, values for the system. Uh, otherwise, you can also mention here, mentioned it in this NDP file. For um, the NDP file, uh, basically main structure remains the same, only that uh, you continue on um, these things from your uh, previous configuration file. And uh, here we also changed it uh, to the n number of steps because we want uh, one nanosecond. So our dt is the time step of each, um, uh, each simulation time step and of our uh, MD integrator. And um, from there, how many time steps we can use. And finally, we uh, like multiplying it, we will basically get that we will, we will learn for this amount of time. We also save the coordinates and the velocities in this section. We continue uh, the simulations with uh, this uh, this directive as yes. Uh, we place uh, the links algorithm only on the hydrogen bonds, and uh, that we can define here. We can also uh, not place any uh, constraint. It it depends uh, on what type of system you are actually wanting to simulate. 
uh, or you can constrain all the bonds, not just hydrogen bonds. For other systems, you can just constrain all the bonds. Uh, you can use it accordingly. The other two important things is uh, like the temperature coupling and the pressure coupling because you are using an MPP ensemble. So here you we have used uh, a most simpler one, which is the velocity rescale uh, because uh, you know, this is like a very uh, simplified version where at every uh, step uh, it tries to um, um, after a certain uh, time interval of course it uh, when the velocity uh, um, after time interval when the velocity of the molecules or the uh, temperature fluctuates from its equilibrium value then it rescales the velocity and brings back the velocity uh, to the system temperature and um, so these are the that time constant used for um, that um, for the um, velocity the scale of uh, thermostat. Uh, we want to simulate the temperature uh, system at 300 Kelvin. And uh, after that, uh, we use our pressure coupling as a Berenson. cell. So there are uh, uh, other methods also available, but we will use Berenson over here. We, uh, we use our pressure coupling, which is isotropic in nature. And uh, most importantly, we also use a PVC here because uh, in the previous case, uh, probably it was also written, else it al always takes because uh, whether you want to PVC uh, in all the directions, X, Y, Z. And for pressure coupling, you can also use it semi-isotropic if you, for example, uh, you don't want it to be equal uh, pressure scaling from all, uh, uh, uniform to be from all directions. So you can use it like uh, semi-isotropic. We don't want to generate velocities, we just want to con continue from the previous equilibrium uh, energy minimized configuration. So we will just put it no and we will put the continuation as yes. So this is the basic framework of the NPT. Similarly, for the NPT, we have everything similar except uh, we will use, we will keep the pressure coupling off because uh, this is a constant volume. So we keep the pressure coupling on. We will just keep uh, this um, uh, this thing and because here we have mentioned the pressure coupling is set to low. And even though other things are written, but as it is set to low, the system will not take the pressure coupling. And uh, we, is, uh, we also uh, keep uh, the temperature coupling on like the velocity of the scale. So once this um, this is the NTP of the files and all the postgres files we have, we basically can uh, run um, for this system. It's not possible because of the time constraints. I cannot run for others. So basically, we will uh, do GMX prompt uh, and minus uh, NTP dot and minus C S P C E prompt and minus P dot and in So uh, here we, we have already received it ls, then you will find it that is an mdp.ttr of this generator. So doing empty run, uh, then we have an ls b and we have the we define the file links the system runs and the potential energy has al almost reached and it's not subsequently changing with some of the steps. So they have converged within 74 steps and this is the potential energy which is negative. And uh, here we have uh, got a energy minimized configuration which is our EM dot pro. So our EM dot pro. So using this step wise we will keep on doing as uh, we have shown in the slide, we will keep on doing the NBT ensemble. I don't have much time, so I will directly go to the NBT ensemble um, and will show you uh, that this is my data which is already saved for the NBT log file, which I got finally after the NBT run. We, I have NBT ecstasy, uh, NBT profile, and the NBT DR. So uh, basically here, what we will do is uh, we will mainly do uh, this for, uh, for the analysis of the system. So first, uh, the first analysis that we will uh, perform is uh, mainly uh, determining the structure 
or the radial distribution function, uh, which is the pair correlation function uh, for the um, molecules in the system. And um, the, this is um, essentially if you have a particle at the center R and uh, you, you want to see how the, uh, the density of the system in an interactive, uh, in, in, when the particles are interactive in nature. So in an interactive system, what is the density around this particle I uh, with respect to uh, what would have been if the system has an uniform distri uh, distribution or in an ideal case. So uh, um, basically uh, in details, we if we go, then this is the number of uh, the particles that would be found in all these beams if we bin it uh, accordingly. And we have a uh, with a small beam distance of dr, then what would be uh, how many number of particles we would find here in the first shell, in the next cell and so on. And uh, with time it will definitely decrease and it will become an ideal case. So in principle, this is the ideal number of particles where uh, the system was uniformly distributed. And uh, then we can get a first peak of GR, a second and a third. And finally, after some value um, or our distance, we find that it attains a bulk density and therefore both the numerator and the denominator becomes equal and it's enough. So for calculating this, uh, here we have a water molecule. So oh, well, this oxygen and two hydrogen. So in GR, uh, in Romax, we can do this as GR. We can use this tool as GR, GMX RDF. So GMX RDF, we use this um, uh, GMX RDF. We use uh, this XTC file, which is our output file. We can use the PPR file, and we can create this RDF which is our GR output file which gives actually essentially this data for plotting this uh, plotting this. So um, so let us try that once more. I already have this in here but uh, we can just uh, try it. It takes some time to run the data because um, it's not possible to run it right now but at least uh, let us try. So GMX RDF is like minus F with the two then we would put in nvt.xtc and we do like uh, in nvt.xtc uh, and we also need to mention that which molecules what are the type of we want to set whether we want to take the molecular center center of mass of the molecules so you can also use um, MOC, uh, MOL C com, or you can directly use just com, uh, because here, uh, anyways, it is um, the center of mass, uh, so you can use it. And uh, this is the reference, um, reference position of um, the molecule, selection of the reference position of the molecule, which you do. It. So uh, you want to, uh, this the last two directives is they mainly mentioned like uh, what is whether you want to take the center of mass of the whole molecule or the center of mass of the, just the molecule you have defined, your sol molecule you have defined and this gives uh, the selecting the reference position of which molecule you want to uh, because your system may contain different types of molecules. So on which molecule you want to calculate the GR. Uh, for, for this case, it is simpler. You only have water molecules, but for your by, uh, by uh, your multi-component system, there you might have two or three different types of molecules, so or um, residues. So, on which one you actually want to calculate, you can mention it over here. So, uh, once you do this, you get this uh, this command prompt where you have to give these numbers whether you want to do it on the water, you want to do it on the system. So if it is on the water, then you press 1. You can also press 0. Your water on system is both the same. So you do it and you do control D. And your system actually starts reading the frame and analyzing the data. So I will stop it here. So it's already created um, beforehand. Uh, we have this here as rdf.xvg. If we open it in X and Grace, then we can find um, So uh, this is what we can see here, essentially what we have plotted here. 
you can see here uh, by XMS. So if you are uh, quite familiar with XMS, then it's not a problem. Or you can, uh, XMS is otherwise very simple. You can just uh, go here and uh, import your data here, whatever, wherever the file systems are, you can just import your data here and you can plot it. So, um, so this is the RDF for the center of mass. For example, if you have uh, a case where you just want to selectively take for the oxygen atom or you want to selectively choose for the oxygen hydrogen. So in this case, you basically have to get an index file. In Romax, the index file is uh, nothing but um, you uh, make index. Uh, for example, if you make it like G, make index, uh, all this um, like uh, specific tools, uh, it's uh, I have already mentioned uh, in the talk also in the last slide. But otherwise, you can go on the Gromax online site and you will find it. What are the utilities of each of these tools? So you basically fix up a grow file. You have to give, you have to supply a grow file, and you have to generate a uh, index, uh, for example, an index file. So how you do that? For example, you want to select. So basically, uh, you want to select here atoms, uh, for example, oxygen and OW and uh, HW. So you select that atom OW and you select as atom HW and uh, OW and just a second. So, oh, okay, so H1, so it's named as H1. OW and you select as HW star because you want to select both the hydrogens. So, uh, you do a Q and you finally get an index file. Yes, and if you see there is a system which is indexed, there is is this OW which is indexed and in the similar way you can see there is the HWs which are indexed. So indexing helps is when you run for example. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Pal, yes. sorry to interrupt. If you can finish in five minutes then we can have time for oh. one or two questions. Okay, sure. Uh, so basically here when you um, do any, uh, any of these calculations in this index, uh, if you use this index file as uh, minus n index, just with the same thing, um, then you essentially what you get um, uh, is what you get here. What you get here is the selection type of the oxygens. For example, if you want to take between oxygen and hydrogen, so basically you, you can give it select is like 3 and 2 and you can uh, get a RDF for that specific uh, pairs. So uh, this is mainly the first part. So uh, this is in a uh, quite a lengthy thing. So in a similar way, you can do the mean square displacement, which is nothing but GMX and uh, in, uh, GMX. Uh, you do it with the GMX uh, NSD tool, and from there you will get uh, with the command prompt just the way we did it for RDF. You do it for zero and one prompt, and you can get the trajectory of the particles, and they also gives you the slope from which the diffusion coefficient can be measured. Uh, similarly, the, the GMX hydrogen bond is used for getting the hydrogen number of hydrogen bonds. So uh, for the number of hydrogen bonds, if we set a criteria that the donor site and the acceptor site, the oxygen, uh, the, the donor and oxygen atoms are at a distance of like 0.33 nanometer, then we can use it as minus R flag. And if we have this angle defined, uh, which has to be less than 30, then basically we can get all the number of hydrogen bonds with this criteria uh, can be uh, can be uh, we can get it in this XPG file, which is the number of um, hydrogen bond number XPG. We have a distance distribution of uh, the all the distances in which this are uh, both the oxygen atom comes and also the angle distributions that are possible. 
So uh, the second system, it's uh, we don't have the time to discuss about it, but um, here I have done it all in the detail. So you can basically have for the biomolecular system, you can basically have a PDB file which is already downloaded from the RCSB website. You can use the GMX PDB uh, command to extract this PDB file to a Go file. On the command prompt, you have to type it uh, like 15 to select your force field and uh, command uh, type again 7 to select your SPC water model. And for example, if your protein molecule has a total net charge of positive or negative, whatever it is, so you have to keep it in mind. Otherwise, you have to neutralize it. So the next step, as uh, we said before, that we have to neutralize, the, uh, we have to create a box and uh, with minus box and minus center centering the protein molecules in the center. We solvent the box uh, with um, like n number of here, it is like 3000 uh, approximately number of water molecules that has to be written in the last line in the top file. And um, so using this, uh, we mainly add the number of ions in the system because we want to uh, basically um, neutralize the system because there was total already total charge 18, so we need like eight um, electrons, uh, chloride ions to neutralize the system. So the processes remain the same as we have done. We can do a uh, root mean square deviation, which essentially gives how much uh, the protein molecule is deviated from its native structure. So this uh, radius of gyration and uh, mean square displacement is uh, mainly essential for giving the molecular flexibility or uh, getting the molecular conformations and uh, uh, how the molecule secondary, uh, how the structural conformation changes with time, you can calculate from there. And these are the GMX RMS and GMX gyrate are the two um, tools that you can use here. For the secondary structure, you can similarly use uh, GMX uh, Rama, which is for the Ramachandran plot, and that gives uh, the distribution of pi and the psi dihedrons. Of the torsional uh, dihedrals possible along the bonds um, C and C N and C alpha, C and C alpha and C alpha and C carbonyl. So in this case, uh, it, it, it gives a kind of estimation of uh, what are the feasible structures possible, and these empty spaces are definitely the places where, due to spheric hindrances, the conformations are not possible. So this kind of small uh, analysis is, you can uh, obviously do it with Romex, but uh, for other your uh, user defined uh, codes uh, for your user defined functions and so on, you have to definitely use this uh, trajectory and uh, write handwritten codes. And finally, this is a task for you. I, I will keep it also in the folder uh, where this is a trip cage in water and you will exactly follow the same steps as the last system and uh, hope you will uh, feel much more useful and uh, to use the systems and also the modules I have listed here so that you don't have a problem. You can directly use it with all this uh, command line. So here are the useful links and uh, the books you can follow up in the uh, in, in the links Hello. of the book. Yeah. So finally, I thank yes, everyone. Yes. Yeah. Your presenter in, in couple of minutes will start. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Pal. And uh, also, I'll request you to kindly uh, send me the last slide at least so that I can share the course material with the uh, uh, participants. Yeah, sure. and if there, there, is, there are one or two questions we can accommodate and then we'll start our validatory program. Okay, I, I see that. Uh, okay, just give me a minute. Yeah, is Mr. Sandeep? You have some question. You can unmute yes, yourself. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, no, very nice talk, uh, ma'am. My question is, if uh, some residues is, is missing uh, when I when I try to create in topology file, then how to fix that in the PTB? If some residues. <laughs> Oh, okay, so there is a um, package known as modular. You can also use that. It is um, an open package, and you can see it also. Um, there are uh, on their um, website and YouTube also. You can find a nice demo given 
so you can actually fit uh, the number of missing hydrogens from there. Okay, okay, ma'am. Ma'am, another question is uh, when we uh, get the output dot uh, trr or dot xcc, then we have to uh, dump uh, at every every time step or another uh, after a hundred time step. Then they are equivalent uh, to uh, plot the trajectories. Yes, uh, you can uh, dump it like after every uh, ten because like every ten or hundreds or whatever because. Uh, with every like uh, successive steps, it, it, uh, they are correlated uh, in time. So um, I mean, saving at every like uh, every time step would be uh, quite uh, um, it would be quite um, computationally okay. quite extensive because you have to yes. then need lot of uh, trajectory uh, space to keep your trajectory. Okay, yeah, so you. Not, uh, you can save it like after every ten hundred steps. It depends on what type of also system you want to analyze because um, if you want to analyze at like short time dynamics for something, then you need like at quick frequent intervals. But uh, if you basically look into the long time dynamics of a system where uh, the motions are like in several picoseconds, or uh, then basically you don't need a uh, one femtosecond or ten femtosecond gap to save your trajectory. Gaurav Chakravarti. Am I audible? Hello, yes, yes, go ahead. Please go ahead. Ma'am, I have one question that how can I generate the topology and other input files uh, for a non-standard non molecule that is for which the parameters in the force field does not match? Okay, so uh, in that case, what you have to do, uh, actually I also had to do it some times back. So uh, there are molecules where it might not be uh, defined. So uh, in that case, you have to, it would be a bit tedious, but you have to write it manually because I did it manually and I filed it because there, um, I believe there is one tool, uh, I know, but uh, also sometimes relying on the tool is not uh, quite because you are not sure what are the parameters it's using inside. So if you already have a paper from where you take the force fields, you can just write it in the format of romance, like the bonds and the angles, you can just list it down. Yeah. And uh, from there, uh, the, what are the bond values and the angle values, what are the bond it makes, so that you can easily do it. So you can suppose for any molecule which is uh, not there directly in the uh, topology, you can do it that way. The format should be the same. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you all, uh, and thank you, Dr. Pal, for your uh, detailed description of how to use these softwares, especially Gromax. Thank, thank you very much uh, for helping us here. Thank you. We'll uh, thank you, participants. Also, we'll now move to the validatory uh, program. With us, uh, we are uh, privileged to have uh, Sri. Milin Kulkarni, uh, who is the departmental head from uh, Department of Science and Technology, and uh, Sri Kulkarni is the uh, one of the backbones uh, behind NSM project from DST. He, he is looking into DS NSM projects. We have uh, with us uh, uh, Mr. Ashish Kubelkar from uh, CDEC. He is uh, looking into the nodal center activities of NSM. And uh, our uh, head of the department, uh, Professor Pavitra Mitra. So uh, I welcome uh, all of them to the uh, to the validatory program, and uh, bef uh, and then I'll uh, will will be happy to uh, get their insights and their views on this workshop. Before that, I uh, will quickly present uh, some of the feedback that we got from. Uh, this this program which will be uh, helpful for us for future discussions also. So we hosted this program uh, for last three days and there have been a number of speakers from different fields and uh, different organizations. We have uh, uh, some of our IIT Kharagpur uh, uh, dignitaries as well as we have uh, two uh, uh, very renowned faculty from ISC Professor Somendu Raha Hope my screen is visible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then also we had uh, people from NVIDIA who helped us and they described, described a lot of uh, important developments in GPU computing uh, in the domain of scientific computing, very 
new tools and their achievements, etc. We had around 1600 plus registrations and uh, at any point of time there are around 200 participants in any of these sessions. And though though it is holding online mode, there are several issues in uh, and technicalities at different parts. So we got a very good participation and then we got feedback from more than 300 participants yet. I have circulated the feedback from day uh, yesterday and uh, participants are still giving their feedback, but I got a, a quick, I made a quick analysis of this three, 300 plus participants data. We saw that uh, there are around 10 percent uh, uh, participants who are experienced researchers in these domains. There are around 60 percent who are beginner and few, of course, one third of the participants got their uh, introduction. Sorry. Uh, 120 participants said that they are uh, actively researching in this area. And then we asked them that uh, whether they want future workshops in NSM and what are their interests. We saw that uh, there is a large interest in artificial intelligence data science followed by high performance computing and also other domain areas like CFD, computational mechanics, uh, molecular dynamics, uh, computational biology and materials. There are several in interests. And also there are some other areas which participants suggested we didn't ask that uh, whether they are working on this particular areas, but they suggested that if there are future workshops on astrophysics, climate physics, climate water modeling, weather modeling, quantum computing, solar energy, MATLAB, drug discovery, etc., then they will be beneficiate, benefited. So uh, fr from our nodal center and the uh, uh, fraternity of the nodal centers across the country, we can uh, probably we'll discuss in future that if we can host workshops in, in all these areas and around 200 participants have requested for hands-on workshops. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic situation, we cannot host these workshops. But once uh, from new normal, we move towards better normalcy, we'll plan to host the workshops. Uh, thank you all. And I'll now request uh, uh, Sri Kulkarni to kindly share his views. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I really congratulate IIT Kharagpur, uh, Sanjay Bandopadhyay and his team who organized this workshop very smoothly. I uh, listened to the lectures yesterday for two hours, day before yesterday for uh, one and a half hour. And uh, today I could not join, but I joined just now because I was busy in some office work. Uh, that aside, I think uh, because of this online workshops, we have been able to train many people uh, into taking HPC as or uh, uh, taking HPC as uh, as their mode of programming, and with uh, you know uh, specialized training by uh, media people, I think such workshops are going to help. Uh, not only the students, but the PhD uh, students basically into if they are into HPC programming as to what type of parallel programming they should do. The other thing that uh, I have found out from uh, Kuvelkar is that because of these workshops, our area coverage is quite wide. So maybe, you know, uh, that is the reason why uh, Professor Somnath just said that uh, there was very less, uh, you know, uh, attendance in some cases. But maybe what we can do, uh, we can have regional workshops. For example, IIT Kharagpur can organize for people in the east, eastern area or in the or, or in the northeastern area. We can uh, have some uh, other ISC organizing it in the southern area, something like that. Maybe with less uh, type, you know, the, with that type of distribution, it will be much more focused workshop that we can do even. It, you know, interface which the students want can be done that way. And uh, we have plans of doing in, uh, interaction workshops also, uh, uh, where people can work on hand, experimental uh, can be done and they can be trained accordingly. From the participants list, I see that you have very good, uh, you know, 
lot of participants 60% of the participants were new new people into who were into this uh, thing for the first time and that is what we want in nsm because if we have a lot number of people into hpc area naturally our programming capabilities will grow and uh, that would be a success of uh, nsm definitely we are now coming up with a second phase of nsm which will be exascale computing uh, when it will get approved i can't tell it right now but there are plans of uh, preparing a second phase uh, uh, note and uh, this phase i think will get extended by at least one year or one and a half years because of the pandemic lockdown and other things but uh, we have already uh, set up seven uh, supercomputers by this time another 11 are going to be set up by december this year so we will have almost 17 supercomputers of good capacity and even if iit kharagpur wants some uh, gpu uh, to uh, additional gpus along with this computer we can take that as a call and uh, we can give it to you thank you sir uh, th- th- thank you shri kulkarni Uh, in fact i discussed about exascale computing to the students and the, and the initiatives on that yesterday yes <clears throat> so so good that uh, we, uh, uh, we can probably prepare uh, our uh, next generation in line uh, students in line so that they can pick up ex- yes, exascale yes, computing yes. in few years and also we have uh, uh, professor mitra from our head of the department has put up a request for more gpus Okay. Uh, so okay. Uh, you can send the request to CIDAC yeah. and uh, with a copy to me or uh, somebody. We will take it up in the next EB meeting and get it up. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We'll we'll forward the yeah mail to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now we we also have uh, Professor Bandavad Thai who uh-huh. uh, pres- who had also a talk this morning. Uh, but uh, professor bandavadha if you also can kind of quickly access uh, address the students today well uh, uh, it is very nice to see i am very pleased to see that the uh, this workshop you know uh, was a very success and uh, it's good to see you bilin ji after a long time yes yes and yes. i hope everything is fine and also ashish is here i guess so uh, good to see you all um i, I this uh, workshop as minin ji said you know i i was i am very happy to see that the most of the participants are beginners and new yes and, uh, because that that means we are able to spread this uh, awareness okay and um, uh, because people who are experienced they will find a way to you know uh, use it and access they know all the tricks but most important is to bring this pool of new people so um, i'm very happy because this um, uh, number of participants was very large and uh, you know across the discipline yes so we can take this workshop i think as a template because we had many people from different areas from here we can uh, think of having some focus on the workshop in some focus areas so where we will have a you know in a particular area uh, maybe a, a small number of uh, participants but that will be very focused audience and then you can take a pick up uh, one topic and then go into details of hpc you know uh, applications and then if hands on can be done post pandemic that will be uh, and wonderful things okay so uh, we will see i think it will be good uh, somnath you have done a wonderful job with uh, pavitra uh, in organizing the workshop so i congratulate you and uh, you know looking forward to many such uh, workshops from iit kharagpur and all, as well as other uh, you know uh, nodal centers okay so thank you thank you uh, maybe maybe uh, you can organize such workshops in the areas that you have now you know listed cfd and other things yeah, yeah. yeah. in those specialized more, more areas so many we can uh, parallelly carry out those workshops yes yes uh ashish uh, sir if you if you can also address them once more <laughs> uh, thank you so much uh, sanjay sir good to see you too and uh, hope you come to pune soon <laughs> yeah hope so <laughs> like you have been really a uh, uh, good supporter of the nsm hrd activities and uh, i am happy to say here or acknowledge that every meeting uh, 
professor bandopadhyay has uh, attended in person in pune and he used to travel via bombay because though there were direct flights uh, because of their india restrictions so i am actually i i, I was uh, quite um, you know impressed that he took that pain this should take take additional one day to reach pune but he did that so that shows his commitment and it is showing off uh, i think he that he has rubbed off on his colleagues like pavitra and somnath also and that is why iit kharagpur has been able to do this uh, yes. such kind of uh, workshops and as uh, i would uh, again support what milin sir and sanjay sir said that next step could be that we have uh, focus workshops like cfd and all those uh, so that two three days focus for that community uh, so that will uh, i think another thing that uh, maybe we can uh, uh, once you do those focus workshop another thing that you can do is possibly uh, build up a community of those who join in terms new, of new uh, yeah people. yeah so that you have a mix of uh, new people as well as you have experienced people Correct. and many of the things they will be able to address between them so like a forum or something that we should uh, think of under nsm wherein we give them a platform to these uh, researchers and those with uh, i mean something like a special interest group or whatever some good name you can uh, call them yes. and so that they get connected between them one is like uh, this kind of thing that we see that uh, there is uh, as we take the initiative to bring together the faculty or uh, the experts who give the knowledge but uh, that is so let's say that happens today but this learning is a continuous process or problem that they face is a something continuous so like uh, i mean equal and not equal, like a quora but something like that that you have a forum you tell i have this issue then somebody else gives oh i to face that issue this is the way one you can uh, solve it yes. and so that way you have all of them com- connected so this could be a good way to connect them that's what i feel that could be a value addition from our side and once you do that for various such uh, communities you start off with uh, uh, some such workshop where they are come together and then they get connected so that would be my suggestion to you okay. okay so well well done uh, good job sir and this uh, what somnath was saying that at any given point in time only about 300 were there but they would have based on their uh, like this was a like a generic workshop so somebody was in, interested in some part of it so he yes. would have attended it so maybe i think if you take the cumulative number it's going to be high right. but what he was telling is at any given point in time so many were there so yeah. i am sure uh, more would have attended and another thing uh, like yesterday that on the first day i realized that some of them have their other uh, assignments or something attend classes so they will view the recordings so we have recorded it and they will view the recording so i think uh, if 1600 have uh, registered i think more than 1000 would have taken advantage of it or maybe close to 1500 would have taken advantage of it in some way or the other based on uh, their uh, need or their interest i think that's what i would uh, like to say and thank you uh, over to you somnath yeah thank thank you very much so also we we have recorded all the sessions and also we have uh, uh, we are trying to make a course material out of this workshop which will be made available to all the participants in in couple of days okay uh, uh, now i'll uh, request professor pavitra mitra head ccds to kindly uh, yeah. share his views yes th- thank you sanjay da actually the uh, it is still sanjay da has built to a great extent i am just uh, holding his uh, i mean holding his flag for a little more time and it's a it's a great uh, g- great experience for all of us uh, thank you sanjay da for such a wonderful thing and i would like to tell you it is not just for the uh, for the audience outside iit kharagpur for audience iit kharagpur itself has a big population of researchers it has become the lifeline of of uh, phd students at iit kharagpur the param shakti system and uh, thank you sir thank you ashish sir thank you milin sir for all the support we will continue with your blessings we will continue the uh, good work that we have started we will we'll do our best we are planning to hold specialized workshop for the northeast also we are i and somnath are in talk with them uh, focused on them uh, on depending uh, with a, with a particular area or particular university we are trying to build that and uh, we, we hope that we will be able to go forward and i think sir one of the thing will be very much helpful i have written down all the feedbacks you have given we will we will try to follow them 
uh, to the best of our capabilities. And, and one thing I feel that if some of the participants said this is a great opportunity for them to talk to you because we are just the uh, just the facilitator. The, the it is it is a national property, so everybody is entitled to use it. So if you can hear something from the uh, from the participants, you can directly ask what you need in future. Uh, so that the the, the as as Minister has rightly said, we you need to form a community, and you are the pioneers. You are attended this workshop. You need to spread the word to other other colleagues, other friends, so that this. So if you have anything to say, or if you have um, any requirement which you feel, because we don't know about the reality, ground reality in your university and other things. If we can know about that, it will help us a lot. If you can speak a little bit, any participant, if you want, you yeah, can say yeah, something. Participants, if you want to speak, please raise your hands. Uh, Somnath, just uh, one point. Uh, you can, uh, maybe the participants can say whether any drawback of this workshop. Right, so I, I, uh, so ask, I, I ask that information from that them. Uh, in the so feedback, we, and we, are, feedback. we are compiling that also. Uh, so uh, in the feedback form, I asked for those that information too. Yeah, cool. That if there are any issues, we are compiling them. But right now, if some of the participants want to share any uh, comment, any feedback, uh, we'll be very happy to listen from you. Okay. Just give me a minute. Mehul Kumar. Also, I think uh, participants, just one more point I'd like to mention that uh, not only attending the workshop, you might be wanting to use the HPG source. So we are, uh, we, we, there is a possibility for that. If you need, if you have some requirements or do you something, you can mention that also. Mehul, if you can please unmute yourself. Uh, yes, hello. Yeah, so good evening, sir. Uh, so I didn't receive the feedback form yesterday. Oh, I so, mailed it to everybody, so I'll, I'll sh uh, share it with you again. And it, there was issue with the joining also, so I was not able to see the uh, the, the the chat box. So no, because I, you are outside this organization, you will not see the chat box. So oh. time and when I uh, showed what I wanted to share in the chat box in the uh -huh, yeah, uh, yeah, screen yeah. itself. Okay. Huh. But uh, if, if you can shoot me an email, I don't know why didn't you get the feedback form. If you can please shoot me an email, then I'll uh, okay. or CCDS office, I will share the feedback form. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other participant wants to share anything? So we, we got an uh, uh, idea about the shortcomings of the workshop. I asked them to write if there are some issues. So many of them has shared some of the comments, like uh, in some cases uh, they needed a prior background to uh, understand the topic, etc. We are compiling them and in in up, uh, upcoming workshops, we'll uh, try to look into those issues. Good. Okay, I don't see uh, anybody wants to speak now because they're OK. There is one. Thanks. Yes, sorry, you, you have to unmute yourself. Uh. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Saurish Vera, Associate Director from CTEC Noida. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank you, uh, the organizer, uh, organizers, uh, IIT Kadapur, all the HODs, uh, all the professors. And this was a wonderful session. I think uh, we got a lot of insights. These were really scientific computing. These were a lot of pointers were there. We were actually not into this field. So we look forward, how do we actually, we will try to put up some proposals uh, as uh, we normally do from the funding agency. We will look how these things can be implemented and definitely uh, I think uh, we will uh, again take the help of IIT. So that was, uh, uh, I think this is one thing I was interested to share. So we are, since we are beginners, but definitely we will try to uh, invest in this field. So thank you, uh, Professor Somnath, uh, Professor Sanjay, and uh, all the professors, uh, Dr. Milin, and uh, uh, all the people for the organizing this workshop. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Subhamai Panda, if you want to share anything. You have to unmute yourself. Yes, please, yes, please. Can I Sir, first of all, I uh, express my heartfelt gratitude to everybody, organizers, as well as the NSM facility, IIT Khadakpur, uh, personally to Milan, sir, and the Professor Somnath, sir, Professor uh, Sanjay Bandhapadhyay, sir, and Professor Pavitra, sir. Uh, I am from the biology field, so it is my dream for the last of couple of five or six years to do something in the field of the molecular dynamics and these things. So in the last year, in 2020, there is a drug discovery hackathon is uh, organized by the um, NSSM in the in the field um, at that very moment of time. I am just uh, accustomed with these things, but a lot of th uh, theory part is not uh, at that moment is clear to me. But this workshop gives me a great opportunity to learn those things. So I, I again uh, grateful to all the learned persons and faculty members from the prestigious IIT Kharagpur and looking forward in the field of this kind of research uh, with some of the experts from this prestigious institute. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much to think this kind of workshop as well as the facilities that NSA is uh, working in the India right now. Because uh, this kind of, uh, because uh, I'm from a uh, college, so there is no such kind of facility of, of the high performance uh, calculations and this sort of thing. So but with the help of this NSM uh, 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 spine, we can at least uh, uh, do some kind of work uh, in this particular field. So again, sir, I thank you so much, the NSM, uh, the, or, uh, the heads, as well as the organizers from the IIT Khadakur Somnath sir did a very good job for the last couple of three days. So I really uh, grateful to him also. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Pavitra sir, and thank you Sanjay sir, you also give us a very basic as well as uh, fundamental things in the area of molecular dynamics. I express my gratitude to Sanjay sir also. Thank you so much sir. Thank you. Looking forward to your future sir. Thank you. In fact, we have a program uh, programming uh, in molecular dynamics which is being developed by CDAC Pune. Uh, Rabin, uh, Dr. Joshi is doing it. So you can in fact make a trip to Pune and talk with uh, Joshi ji, Rajendra Joshi, and he will. He is a, a person who can tell you in and in about molecular dynamics. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for the kind information. Okay, yeah. sir. Yeah. Sir, sir, uh, sir, Joshi, sir, sir, Ravindra Joshi. Ah. Huh. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. And that very moment of time, Rajendra, Rajendra Joshi. His name is Rajendra, Rajendra Joshi. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Soma, you want to share something? Uh, please unmute yourself. Yes, sir. So it was a great workshop. I learned a lot. I want to know that uh, from where I could know about the next uh, workshop. It's because um, uh, about the, this, I got to know from one of my friends in IISC. So I want to know that uh, is there any website or sa something from where yeah. I will get to know? Yeah. See, normally this information is available on the DST website. Whenever a workshop is scheduled, we place the schedule on the DST works, uh, website itself. Yeah, because the uh, or CDAC website, you may find it because the NSM website was created, but apparently it is still not uh, you know updated. That is the problem. So, uh, so DST, DST website, you can always see. We will, I will be posting everything on DST website whenever there is a workshop scheduled or uh, next workshop is going to be scheduled. I will definitely post it. Yeah. You can also see uh, we maintain a website for the Nodal Center. Yeah. CCDS IITKGP.ac.in and there you will find Nodal Center and our activities as well as uh, Nodal Centers combinedly uh, arrange some of the workshops. That will also be reflected here, and there is Ashish sir can also tell about AI6 and uh, the other websites. Yeah, as uh, Milin sir said uh, that uh, actually I also posted on NSMIndia.in, but uh, that is under revamping. So 
uh, actually this uh, feedback we will take forward and make sure that uh, uh, whatever workshops are conducted by all the uh, nodal centers we should have some place where uh, we can uh, put this together in our next meeting of nodal center uh, coordinators so not let's take this up and see sure. because iit madras is also conducting a lot of uh, such okay. workshops recently okay. they finished one in construction there is one uh, that is going that is going to come up uh, i think in uh, parallel programming or something uh, it's there if you visit nsmindia.in i have posted it there nsmindia.in uh, in the events uh, section it's there so that's where uh, soma ji you can uh, have a look okay so in case that interests you that is again a small i mean uh, not a full day workshop but i think it's a multiple days but part time workshop so you can check that out in fact ashish my request would be that whatever workshops you are doing if you can send one to me i can yeah. post it on the dst website because dst website is accessible to many people even abroad sure sir we will keep doing that we will keep yes. doing that so that you know okay. at least till i am there till march 22 yeah. at least i can post it uh, definitely okay sure sir sure okay yes yeah. okay. sir i have one question i am pavitra speaking i have one yeah. question can i ask yeah 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 so so to assist sir and milin sir the question is one thing we are planning is that because there are many software code and other thing we are planning a github page and a stack overflow community uh, so uh, so where all the code base that we develop in the all the courses will keep with the video recording as well as many data set sample problems worked okay. out examples and so do you think should we build a community or should uh, with cdac we should build our own uh, own uh, social network kind of thing or we use a general social network like stack overflow for technical purpose uh, so it can think a li- i want your advice sir on this nay each area has uh, you know specialized uh, people as uh, as uh, you know we have recently funded uh, 94 application development projects uh, through isc and that we found out that each area has some specialized people and those specialized people should be able to do such a social networking but iit kharagpur can take a lead in doing that there should be a, there should be a nodal center which will be doing it for all so any you can choose your areas whichever you think uh, you would be able to do it you can uh, choose those areas and uh, do the updating yourself on your uh, yes. website sir our uh, goal is to build a kind of a developer network yes yes uh, so pavitra uh, my suggestion is uh, you can use any of the back end platforms like you mentioned github or for videos you can use youtube or whatever what you can do is build a portal so that okay, that sir. front end is where it's like a gateway which hmm. is a single stop solution like uh, uh, miss soma mentioned about where it should, where where does she know about the next workshop it's a very genuine question so if there is a portal where all this information one section dedicated to upcoming workshops one section dedicated to completed workshops in that completed workshops uh, these are the uh, topics yes. that were covered or this was the code uh, that is available in uh, resources let's say one section on resources so okay. in that uh, let's say data sets or sample codes so like this uh, uh, i'm sure uh, 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 if we can build a portal then all other nodal centers will also contribute to it yes. see it may so happen let's say uh, uh, if you look at the hpc home page of uh, nodal center at uh, iit madras he is maintaining uh, rupesh is maintaining professor rupesh is maintaining his uh, uh, courses so now you can uh, if you classify it based on let's say for civil engineers for uh, for let's say molecular dynamics engineers like this uh, domain wise if you can put it you can link it to there so he is also actually those videos are on youtube so all that you have to do is take that link and just give some small description yes. and provide a link so a portal Uh, and uh, with help of nodal centers uh, or some research scholars or some help in fact you yeah, can okay. even engage uh, external we have provision in the in the nodal center funding that nsm has given there is a provision for hiring people who can do this job for you so you take advantage of that money is already available uh, uh, with your nodal center so just yes. go ahead and uh, implement the idea i mean uh, and as doctor as uh, milin sir said 
any one nodal center can take the lead and yes. others will cooperate it. and i will make sure that uh, if there are like yeah millions are said uh, about those 94 applications so if i can get from professor satish wadiar what were the verticals in that so we will add people from there and uh, building the community as you said is uh, is a is a perfect way to uh, collaborate and uh, sharing knowledge uh, as this the uh, old hindu mythology says knowledge is the only thing that grows with sharing so i think that should be our <laughs> yes, motto exactly yes sir so then i'll make a draft i'll first run the draft through you once yeah. we can brainstorm and then we can publicize it i i'll Definitely. first make a draft and share with you sure sure sure, sure. that will be really great thank you sir in fact there are you know in that 94 uh, projects that we give there are some areas which are very typical areas where we require manpower to be built and i told them that you do workshops with specialized people and train as many people as possible in those areas so uh, in fact iisc will also be coming up with a set of workshop along with jnc asr and they are going to train people in those very typical areas where you don't have manpower in in the country yes sir yeah, uh, as, as, yeah as he said it's a combination of domain people and the computational and, experts correct, correct. when these two people come together only then you get the worthwhile output so both of them are equally important yes thank you sir we will we, this is a great yeah. input for us we will we'll try to do our best yes and and don't hesitate to take help from i mean engage from I in mean, higher people and uh, offload that work to them because i can as i can understand you are already teaching and doing so many other things we are already supervised we have supervise. already hired sir yeah we, we have monta sir we can do it i oh, was yes. just waiting for the green signal yes no no it you already had it you yes. already had the green signal the day tiwari sir and you all signed the mou uh, in presence of minister of state that day itself the green signal was there money took a little while to reach you but that's that that was a more of a procedural uh, delay so but uh, all that you have submitted in the uh, proposal all that money is the reserved for you you will get it for next year also so go ahead okay thank you all very much and uh, interestingly we had a very fruitful discussion and also uh, some some guidelines for the future regarding our nodal center activities this community build up is is definitely something like a uh, uh, few minutes back uh, uh, from cdac we heard that they are they uh, one part division of cdac they want to collaborate with domain scientists so this type of community build up will be very helpful yes yes okay okay so uh, sh- sh- i would sh- like to you know thank the participants also for you know listening to all the lectures with patience and uh, asking questions and uh, clearing their doubts i hope they would have definitely learned something out of this workshop thank you thank you thank you sir and yes we uh, i i'll again take a, this opportunity to uh, thank all uh, participants all the uh, presenters and uh, dst cdac and nsm for supporting us i thank uh, professor mandavatha and professor mitra for their kind advices uh, for hosting the program as well as uh, ashish sir was instrumental in guiding us through us the nodal center activity and we are fortunate to uh, host you uh, milin kulkarni sir in this uh, valedictory session it, it was great that we got advices from you and i thank you all and uh, uh, we hope we can carry forward the activities we have identified few domains in which um, uh, f- uh, future training is uh, solicited by the participants itself and they showed a commitment that they will be present in future activities and they, in that way we can probably uh, make our community stronger yes. in different hpc areas thank you thank you all uh, and uh, finally let us all thank somnath for the untiring uh, activity definitely all of us a big hand to somnath because he worked really hard uh, thank you somnath thank you thank for the great effort thank you thank yeah. you thank we, you somnath i hope that i, I hope that I, yeah. we can continue these activities yes, in yes, yes. future also, and you can you, you can you know in northeast 
in eastern region also you can spread the activity also so we 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 are in communication with uh, some of the northeast universities also uh, uh, sudden uh, peak in the covid situation is deferring some of the yes, activities yes, yes. but uh, tejpur university tejpur right university has good computer science department yeah, yeah. yes okay yeah already in touch i think yeah we are we are already in communication with okay so. okay okay so thank, thank you. you all yeah and i'll uh, call call it a day thank okay. you okay thank you thank you, thank you participants